and welcome to Decomposing Worm, a worm analysis podcast. That's Clarence. He's the first-time reader and literary expert. And that was Matthias. He's read the story before. In this 12-episode series, we're using critical theory to explore the superhero web serial Worm from a broader perspective, covering Worm in six 300,000-ish word chunks. And today is part one of book four, Overview. So here we're going to close read through arcs 18 through 22, kind of commenting all the most, you know, the key points of the story and kind of reading into all the like little bits, you know, kind of doing this plot based examination of the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't read arcs 18 through 22 yet, please do, because as usual, this is going to be a full spoilers discussion. Uh, So let's let's get into it. So we're going to start off with our overall feelings. Um, so, yes. okay, so what did you feel about arcs, uh, 18 through 22? I, I really liked them. Um, mostly because I really like this part in all novels is mm-hmm. this bit where it's like setting up the last bit, you know, mm-hmm. where it's kind of, um, throughout everything, there's, there's this sort of building tension, right? You know, it's like not quite, not quite yet of like the late stages of rising action, you know, we're like, right. we, we are at the point where we don't have all of the answers, you know, there's little specific pieces that are left out because we haven't quite come to the point where someone sits down and explains the whole thing yet, you know? Yes. Anyways, yeah, so I, it's, I, I liked it a lot. <laughs> yeah, this is the section where some of the, the dominoes are starting to fall, right? Mm-hmm. They've, they've been, um, they, this is the last part where they're getting set up and now the first ones are, are starting to tip over, right? With, um, so, and this is also, the section of Rome with some of the most notable scenes or the, the two scenes that I, um, you know, have a lot of emotional impact with me are right. The cafeteria scene in arc mm-hmm. 20. And then of course the Alexandria and tag, um, double homicide <laughs> in yes. arc 22. Ah, so what an uh, arc. yeah, those are a rather, rather significant section that one. Uh, and of course it also has some of the most, um, you know, violent and, and crazed action in the mm-hmm. echidna arcs. So uh, really, really enjoyable, really interesting. And um, uh, yeah, I really, yeah. really enjoyed this Just all this the part. fighting. All the fighting mm-hmm. is always so like dynamic and interesting and not mm-hmm. like any other fighting that happened beforehand. Yeah, like you don't yeah, get lost in the mix of like, oh, here's another fight. It's like every time it's there's, you know, new pieces of, of like ingenuity, I think. It's really, I like it a lot, the way that, yeah. it's, you know, it's developing and kind of the rhythm of every fight is different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. E- yeah. Each one, you know, uh, a normal superhero fights, right? You already like have just the, the dynamism of just different powers and such. Mm-hmm. And then when it comes to these, you know, significant different threats, right? Leviathan, the Slaughterhouse Nine and Echidna, uh, they're just, just the way that you have to interact with them is completely different, right? Where, um, it, Leviathan's, you know, the big unstoppable bad, like Echidna, right? Mm-hmm. But with Echidna, obviously, you have all the clones. And the clones are, you know, murderous parahumans that you're, you're supposed to kill, like the Slaughterhouse Nine, except they're yeah. actually, like, pretty easy to kill individually. And uh, it just, yeah, they, they feel totally different. And, like, totally some of different. them are chatty and, like, mm-hmm. all these different, like, iterations. It's so interesting. Yes, yes. I, I really... I I want to see just a, a Wikipedia entry on like every single different clone that was created, even the ones that weren't even mentioned that were just like part of the mass, just mm-hmm. because I want to know what their powers are and and stuff. Um, yeah. And yeah, so l- let's let's go ahead and, and and start getting into the the summary because yes. um, there's so much more to talk about. There's as so we go. much more to talk about. Mm-hmm. So uh, of course, as we go through these sections, uh, please keep in mind that it's impossible for us to stop and mention every beat of every through line. We've already the script is. About ten thousand words long. Um, hopefully, it got so long, but it's because <laughs> I am verbose. Yeah, that's um, so. This this week, uh, right? I was traveling, so we we skipped a week. Uh, Clarence is the one who wrote the um, the, the the little the, summary bits, the beats, yeah, the beat summaries. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, where Clarence's voice is there. I think I'm going to try to read those. Um, what's the word for? Uh, verbatim because uh. I just love the way <laughs> that you phrase some of this. Uh, but yes, uh, some of our word count is, is just due to, uh, I, my summaries are usually just like this happened and then I remember it and I, yeah. Well, get I over mean, I kind of insert, like I have a lot of opinion. No, of course, and so of course. When recounting, I, I kind of frame it within an opinion. I of suppose. course. No, um, 
but uh, but yeah so we're gonna miss some stuff uh if we don't mention it by the end of the podcast feel free to you know send us a a comment in one of the reddit threads or send us an email or that sort of thing uh but okay let's let's just go Mm -hmm. let us begin so we start off with arc 18 queen the arc which they fight noel for the first time up until uh skitter gets captured Mm -hmm. so coil's just been murdered uh and we we start off here with uh skitter and dinah right having their their last little conversation Mm -hmm. before uh taylor you know gives up dinah to dinah's parents and there's this moment here uh, i think is pretty significant where dinah is a little bit frightened of of skitter uh yes yeah implies she like like flinches away yeah, that there's there's a, a chance that Taylor is going to keep her, you know, strategically, but actually, you know, never mm-hmm. give her up and she's never going to be free. And so she mentions that and, and then Taylor, you know, then rationalizes, no, I definitely won't do that and gives her up to um, her parents. And that's, you know, a wonderful moment. But uh, yeah, what's, what's, yeah I, I do wonder in that moment, um, if Dinah hadn't said that, would Taylor have kept her? I think that might, that, that's I think somewhat likely. I I think it is definitely likely because like we've seen her pattern of when she's encountering new pair of humans like she has kind of developed a habit of evaluating them and their usefulness right like kind of sorting through what they can do for her and how how to kind of like place them in a position so that she can use them right mm-hmm. which are really i suppose you know like placing in a position where they must help right yeah and then yeah. i think i think kind of seeing you know, Dinah react in that particular way is is really the only thing that kind of shakes her out of that. Like, because right. we see her, we see her sort of in the back of her mind kind of thinking about that. And it's really, it's it's fascinating because she is able to deliberately stop herself from yeah, doing that's, that. Yeah, that's something that she doesn't practice very often. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> any sort of real restraint. Um, yeah, and that she, yeah, that she stops her own rationalization. Yeah. Which, I mean, what does that say about us that we're, like, surprised that she has stopped, <laughs> like, that she has that willpower now? Because, like, I mean, this whole, this whole you know, past few books has been about, like, her kind of slowly chipping away at that, mm-hmm. you know? Well, I almost wonder if, if specifically the reason why she's able to hold back in this scenario is just because it's Dinah. Yeah, and, and I think so. Her, her sole focus for so long. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, after this section, we have Kevin Norton's interlude. Uh aka the most powerful man in the world so uh he S- sion's been listening to him sort of yes. um and listened to him when he gave instructions to go save people across the world um but kevin is dying and so he hands off the responsibility to a woman who gave him a 10 pound note which what a chance you know mm-hmm. <laughs> what a chance to be given <laughs> great final line i loved it 10 pounds to become the most powerful person in the world yeah, i know Something like that, anyway. Yeah. Mm, yeah. This interlude was really interesting. Mostly mm-hmm. because we don't know anything about Sion. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, we... For ca- Zion, I mean, as we... Yeah, I know. As we See, know now. Like, yes. I mean, I guess we kind of know about, like, what people know about him, right? But, like, mm-hmm. we don't know who he is, you know? Like, how, like, this made yeah. me wonder of, like, you know, like, can he speak or does he just choose not to speak? You know, mm-hmm. I mean, because like, right? He said, he said Zion, right? Yes. You know, and but, but then, that's like, the only word ever. Yeah. But then this man, right, Kevin Norton, is really just talking to Zion, right? Not actually mm-hmm. like having having a conversation. A conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but then like, I don't know, like, how long has he been around without people noticing him? You know, because like he didn't. Mm-hmm. It's everything's about like other people noticing. So I don't know. And then he, the whole thing of like, he doesn't, he doesn't really, he's not tied to anybody. That we know of, right? Everything else yeah. is slowly being yeah. seen as how everything is like super, super tied together and integrated. But then right. like, he's just kind of like present, you know? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's true both with Sion and, and this interlude in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is, I think, basically the most, I, I wrote narratively disconnected. I don't know if that's true, but the most, uh, the it has the least connections character wise and, and really plot wise with anything or anyone else in the story yeah it's the furthest it's taking place in the uk right Mm -hmm. um and the only character that we've seen before and that we yeah the only character we've seen before is is scion 
and you know he's more of a force of nature kind of thing and yeah we, we even though this is happening in arc 18 we don't see the results of this mm-hmm. um yeah I, I just find that very interesting it's just another ball rolling very far away we don't know where it's gonna hit just yet yeah it's really fascinating but it's also i mean it's not it's it's more pronounced than the other ones but i feel like the interludes do that a lot of like mm-hmm. kind of rolling the you know bar of ball of yarn i suppose you could say away right and they don't really know that you've encountered it until later mm-hmm. i don't know it's very i'm, yeah, for I'm sure. interested to see about what happens with this yes of course of course yeah and it raises a, a lot of other questions right why is Zion calling himself zion mm-hmm. why is he so apparently sad without actually appearing sad yeah and why is he choosing to listen to kevin norton yeah, so many questions. Mm-hmm. No answers. <sighs> so uh, we get back to the story. Um, so the Undersiders are talking to Miss Militia and mm-hmm. some of the other uh, of the Protectorate and Imperial humans, or of the PRT, uh, to try to get them to work with them to take this threat uh, seriously. They're advocating for it to be a Class S threat. Um, yes. And I don't know. I mean... I, I brought this up specifically because it there was it was an argument technique that mm-hmm. Taylor uses mm-hmm. very often, particularly with um the PRT and the wards and like heroes. I mean she like kind of uses it for like other people too, but it's it really it I feel like it appears so often with heroes is where she's mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, I swear on everything I stand for, like or I have a reason for this and she, you know, kind of expects them to kind of understand that right and i know we've gone over this like a lot but it just it just stood out so starkly to me Mm -hmm. is that her her kind of like she's she's saying you know i I don't know like that it doesn't mean anything to them you know when she's like i swear on everything i stand for like she has but what does she stand for she's not a you know part of an organization or has a very very long track record of honor i don't know it just she her like ethos doesn't have any like weight to it but then she Mm always she always argues like it does yes you know yeah 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 uh so then um to as as a as a compromise to ensure uh the loyalty of the undersider skitter is sort of a hostage more in the like nobility sense right Mm -hmm. um she goes with uh, Miss Militia on the wards, and Clock Blocker uh, is told not to talk to her, but does anyway. And we have this really interesting conversation where Clock Blocker is asking her uh, basically to justify all the horrible actions that she's done, and is somewhat fair to her. Yeah. Ah, oh, I just, I really, really like their dynamic, um, Skitter and Clock Blocker. It's so they like he's so interesting because mm-hmm. um, her conscious that like. She wasn't really, you know, kind of examining, especially right. like right after she killed Coyle. Um, it really, it seems to kind of pick up, right? When he speaks to her and kind of articulates everything that she, his understanding of everything that she's done, right? And he doesn't yeah. even know about like the whole Coyle thing. But I don't know. I don't know what gives, why it's particularly him that mm-hmm. like points this out. I think it's perhaps she sees some sort of like, I don't know, like, like eye to eye sort of thing. That's not what I trying to think of but you know like this kinship i guess you could say of like mm-hmm. it's understanding because he doesn't he doesn't fit into kind of the the prescribed like you know ward's attitude i guess like that weld yeah. would or yeah. like, you know what i mean he's he's a little bit anti-authoritarian yeah too. yeah so i think that's why she, her conscious at this point is kind of oh well you know maybe i should kind of think about what i have been doing and how i'm acting yeah yeah his his main point at the end um is basically you have all these justifications, right? You have all these, you know, reasons behind what you why you do things, but you don't pay attention to the aftermath. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically, talking about Shadowstalker and a couple others, which is such an interesting, you know, mess of irony because uh, it's not entirely wrong for for um, you know so Clockwalker to call out Skitter for it, but yeah. it's not. She's not. She didn't condone that particular action that led it to go that way mm-hmm. right so she's only like it, the, the the responsibility just kind of uh mixes like in, in a in a 
uh, like as an, in a solution. It's very, very hard to tell uh, where responsibility lies with something like that. Yeah. But even though she doesn't know that, you know, Regent was the one to uh, take those decisions, she still says that it was a good idea just because she hates Sophia so yeah, much. Yeah. 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 I suppose, I mean, because she, she holds, she was, you know, the leader, I suppose, at that point. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, I feel like a lot of the actions that the others, the other undersiders take, even, even the ones that she is unaware of, like, she holds that same amount of, like, accountability as, as what happened with Dinah, I think. Yeah. You know, just because they're her, like, people. Right, right. Yeah. If, if Regent had told her what he did, I, I just wonder what her reaction would be. Which she's like, I mean, I, I feel I think like she would make a she wouldn't condone it, but like attempt. Hmm? I feel like she'd make a half-hearted attempt to be like to have their whole like you know run around of like her denying. You know, she's like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. you got to think about the morality of your actions. But then he'd be kind of like, yeah, but you know, is it really that bad? And she'd be kind of like, I mean, you know, I feel like <laughs> basically, I feel like yeah, it would just yeah. be sort of like a. They would make the effort of like having she, that discussion. She would say that it's that it's bad, but like there would be zero consequences yeah, yeah. for for Alec at, at all. Uh, the, the last thing I want to mention here, right, is uh, during that conversation with with Shadowstalk uh, about Shadowstalker, uh, Taylor, you know, is justifying all, all the horrible things and mm-hmm. and um, it, it, justifying some of her anger at the PRT for having someone so bloodthirsty on their team, right? It, it, because uh, she was uh, granted, you know, leniency yeah. af- for her um, prior actions, right? Her probationary set- status as a ward, right? Mm-hmm. And yet, I mean, that's pretty ironic when at the end of this section, Taylor asks for the same thing. And she's not not a murderer, right? Yeah, the, I mean, so, very true. Yeah, yeah. But we'll get more into some of her terrible irony at the end of this later. Yeah. So next section, uh, they get to the PRT headquarters, and there's some uh, various conversations between Miss Militia and Tattletail, and, and then um, Eidolon as well, uh, mm. before Noel calls in. Yes. Yeah. Well, I wanted to make a side note here about Eidolon, mm-hmm. um, because, like, I mean, it's, I mean, I mean, it's not, it's more of like an aside of like me wondering things, I suppose. Okay. Because um, he was talking about right losing his powers perhaps right or like trying to achieve that like um not like plateau or whatever but like the next step or something of you know whatever his powers are or something he thinks there is this sort of like oh a deeper well yeah is what a he deeper thinks well there is. yeah but it, i mean it made me wonder if the like kind of cauldron prescribed powers cauldron made powers have like a shelf life or like an expiration date or something like that Mm-hmm. You know, which, I mean, maybe off base, you know, because the passenger's already kind of, like, stuck there, right? They're already occupying their mind, but I don't know. It They aren't they aren't as chosen, right? They may not be yeah. the destiny. Mm-hmm. And so maybe the passengers are are like Noelle's, where they, they had someone in mind, but now they're stuck with this other person. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Am That's wondering... an interesting speculation. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You had another note here about uh, Miss Malicious and Tattletail's discussion about selfish humans versus good humans. Yes. I feel like they brought up, oh, the reasons, the reasons why people do things or like their expectations of what people were going to do. Or mm-hmm. like Miss Malicious, like people are actually going to be good, so they'll do this. And then Tattletail's like, yeah, but they're inherently selfish. And so they had this whole like huge discussion about what that was. And I was going to find right. it, but I didn't because I got distracted. So we don't have to bring it up if you don't want to. Do you want me to just cut that? Yeah, yeah. I didn't. Okay, I sure, wanted sure, to. Sure. I forgot to go back and look for it. Um, we forgot to put a note here, but we should have a note about Noel calling in. Yes. So uh, at this point, then uh, Noel calls in. Uh, in this is very. It's a very creepy call, in my opinion. Um, with all these, you know, mutated vistas in the background, mm-hmm. saying that she can smell all the heroes, and she gives the the PRT and offer uh, hand over the undersiders and she will kill her clones and leave um which the PRT notably does not take yeah they don't but it's also i mean typically those sorts of calls are not honored you know where they're like ah mm-hmm. oh, turn this person in and you know yeah. I, i'll leave you know they usually don't they're they it usually ends bad yeah, from the uh, from Skitter's perspective, you know, I, I definitely was like, th- this is not. If if they did that, she definitely would 
Um, even if she really believes that she would, Noel mm-hmm. thinks that she would, she would not actually carry through on that. You know, yeah. I, I mean, someone's got to kill her either way. Because right? she, she doesn't can't hold just, like, where autonomy would she go? over her full mm-hmm. self, right? Say again? She doesn't hold full autonomy over herself. Right. Or like over yeah. her body. Which, which they don't all know, but... Oh yeah, that's true. She's definitely not acting normal, mm-hmm. right? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so then uh, Ms. Militia basically assigns the Chicago wards to be sort of the chaperones of uh, the undersiders and says, basically, if you don't follow the rules, if you take off these armbands, if you, you know, do anything against our orders, you uh, are going to get a kill order, mm-hmm. which is rather an escalation. Um, Huge escalation. Mm-hmm. For our resident warlords. Yeah. But I mean, it's also, I suppose it's difficult to sort of... I mean, they're they're dealing with the people who are going to take over the city, right? That are wresting the city's control, right, from them, and have and have um kind of caused a lot of headache, <laughs> to say the least. You know, but yeah, it does seem a lot. Well, actually, I think I think um interacting with the Chicago Wars, especially, we kind of get a sense of what the rest of the nation and the world sees, because like mm-hmm. right now we're just kind of like, oh yeah, we're like going along with this teenage band of people and they're, you know, I mean, there's some like murder and torture, but like no one's, you know, around, right? They're like doing their thing. But then the Chicago ward comes in and you're like, the entire nation has been watching this. Yeah. You know, and I think it, it kind of like, uh, you know, kind of. So you're the teenagers scope. that took over a city. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think that's why it's so interesting. Um, mm-hmm. The scene where Skitter and Tattletail have like, they're off like chatting and having this whole planning session and they're doing their whole like regular sort of banter, you know, like very like serious back and forth sort of thing. And then the wards are just kind of like off to the side listening in, mm-hmm. um, which I feel like it's it has the effect of, you know, like the play within a play sort of thing um, in Shakespeare, you know, where like mm-hmm. there's a there's an audience on stage. And so they have mm-hmm. they have become the audience that we are. You know, it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They're the sort of reflection for us. Mm-hmm. We don't really, since we're in Taylor's perspective, we don't actually react in the same way that they do. But yeah. if we were with them, maybe we would. So after this, we have an interlude with uh, from Crusaders' perspective, mm-hmm. opening, um, talking about torturing Theo, which is a fun opening. Then the yeah. Nazis go to uh, a university and talk to a TA about where powers come from, because they want to give Theo superpowers, of course, mm-hmm. before Crusader decides to abandon uh, Theo there uh, to the PRT. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Crusader is a lot to... Yeah. Yeah. He's just a lot. He really sucks. He does. Uh, <sighs> also, I don't totally understand why there was, like, a prescribed pattern of, of actions that was happening at the beginning. What do you mean? Like, is that... Was that, like, a requirement of how he operates in life, or was that just kind of, like, like the non-reading of the newspaper and, like, the scripted conversation, oh, right, all of with, that? Oh, um, right, with Night and Fog, right? Yes. So, uh, after, you, you know, reading it so many times, basically, as I understand it, the uh, Gesellschaft, which I understand that's how, I'm guessing that's how you pronounce that, that's the, mm-hmm. um, the, the German white supremacist yeah, yeah. organization, right, basically created Night and Fog, um, like... Not uh, from scratch, but they were like brainwashed, a bunch like, of other stuff. Okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah. they basically pretend to be normal humans and they have all this, they, they do the newspaper thing and then cooking way too much food because uh, yes. that's that's just there what they do every really, single day. They're really basically almost programmed to do that. Yeah. Which I think is so fascinating because like we have Rune 2 that, I mean, it's not in this moment, but like previously we see Rune 2 of like, we see the effects of like children and youth who have been brought up in this environment right and then theo Mm -hmm. is kind of a counter to all of them where he like he sees through all of their bullshit right but then he doesn't feel like he can leave because they are really the only like support network that he has established or has been handed i suppose um yeah not to mention that he is you know the son of the leader of a white supremacist or organization so he's kind of like stuck feels that yeah he he can't go to the public probably yeah 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 um, but so in this particular interlude, the thing that stuck out the most, which wasn't really like a plot point, but it was just really, really fascinating to me, um, was the discussion with TA. Also, as mm-hmm. like a side note, the concept of like, like a, like 
studying parahumans and yeah. teaching classes and all of this. And he's like, oh, haha, that's like a whole semester's worth of information. Like, that's so fascinating. You know, mm-hmm. you don't think about like, I mean, that would be kind of a, like a sociology or, you know, like anthro kind of piece of academia. I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it would be so intersectional while yeah, also being a very also be like narrow perspective. Because it's biological, it's, looking at like yeah. neurology and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's psychological, it's biological, it's sociological, it's physical, like, I, I mean, yeah, as in physics. So interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. But his whole, like, thing where he's talking about, like, creating the conditions for, a, like, a natural, I suppose you could say, naturalized trigger event, you know, that you kind of, in order to create something, you need to, like, take away all these little pieces that kind of right. fit you into, like, a social network. Mm-hmm. It was just really interesting, the phrase where he was like, you need support and social pressure to be a good guy, um, which I feel like is Locke, but I'm not totally sure. As in John Locke. Yes, mean. John Locke. Because um, I know it's like part of that era of writing, but um, the whole concept of like social contracts form us into beings that that are good, you know, that we are born bad and then like we become good by society or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's Locke, right? I think so. Or because Rousseau is like I, the one that Rousseau's blank slate. Yeah, and the Hobbes is like we're terrible anyways. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. somebody says something about us being corrupt by society. Is that Rousseau? I think that's Rousseau. Something yeah, that's like Rousseau. That. Yeah, yeah. The, the idea of a noble savage. If you're in the wild, you're a perfectly good person. Uh, yeah, and it, it just it just brought up a, this whole concept of like I don't know an an intriguing bit, I suppose. Of, of an argument for or against, like, what you need to be a good person. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's sort of an aside, but it was just, a, it was an interesting thing to, to sort of place in this moment. Yeah. So as a, as a counter perspective, I think in this particular scene, mm-hmm. the, what I took it to mean is that you need emotional support network in the aftermath of trauma to not carry carry out the worst impulses of your of your trauma right to yeah, to hurt other yeah. people which is i i think there's a statistic somewhere earlier on that's like there's way more villains than than heroes and yeah. i think that's that i mean if you are that does make hurt sense. you're gonna lash out that kind of thing which also i mean this is later on with like the inner interlude but i suppose perhaps that it made me wonder about her encounter of like even though sophia wasn't really like a support or whatever she was like she kind of disrupted that moment that i feel like could have perhaps turned into a trigger event but then did not because she saved her interesting yeah i don't know and then she became she became the social network right this isolated social network that kind of was abusive but um yeah yeah i don't know it was it was intriguing to think about that as like a disrupted moment Mm -hmm. that is an interesting thought We'll we'll talk about more uh, yeah, yeah, that we'll into it more that when we get there. Of course, I I have other thoughts. Um, yes. You you also had a point here. Oh. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Also, um, this whole conversation, this whole like you know, kind of trying to figure out how to make him have a trigger event, make Theo have a trigger event, event made me. It seemed to imply to me that they don't. They either don't know of Cauldron, or they have deliberately decided not to pursue the concept of purchasing powers. Right. Um, which I feel like is corrobor- co- corrobor- corroborated, uh, confirmed, yeah. Yeah. confirmed, um, sure, by the number man interlude. Yeah. Because yes. he was kind of like, oh, I'm just gonna like casually toss in some money and they won't notice, you know. Mm-hmm. So it seemed like they had some sort of disruption, um, in that interaction of like the the German white supremacist group seem to be unaware of i don't know i mean that didn't super co- corroborate it, but it just did it, kind it of felt like there was yeah, yeah there was some sort of unawareness right mm-hmm. perhaps i don't know which i mean it would really uh be a point in favor of of cauldron a very unexpected point if they don't give superpowers to white supremacist organizations yeah. i would not have expected that of them because so. he was deliberately messing up their yeah, whole little yeah, plan he was, yeah yeah yes mm. Yeah. And then this whole, I don't know, this, the aside of, with Crusader, um, his whole little, like, reflection of, like, how he felt was, I was wondering if he was, like, a donor baby, you know, where, like, mm-hmm. the family, like, has a second child so that they can save their first child, like, physically. I, I did not know that was a thing. Yeah. I don't know if it's, like, an actual thing, but 
I don't, I've seen it a couple of times. That's terrifying. Yeah, isn't that horrible? Anyways, you know, yeah. parents are strange sometimes. Yeah. <sighs> well, he turned out a Nazi, so don't, yeah, I mean, it didn't work out it, very it well. Kind of, it's it's like reverse karma, right? It's yeah, karma yeah. going backwards. He was, he's going to be bad in the future, so they hurt him in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Uh, okay. <laughs> so we cut back to the main story. Yes. And um, I think, did I already talk about this before? About handing the undersiders over? Oh, well, yeah, because we left with her kind of, with Noelle's video, right? Or telephone call, video call. I think we left a little bit after. Oh, did didn't we? we? I don't know. I don't know. Perhaps. Maybe maybe I, I have things out and of we, order. I also mix up the chronology of things. That's okay. They, they had this whole like conversation about it, and they're and it, I feel like I brought it up mostly because it was just it, we we were meeting all these this huge amount of people, mm-hmm. and the only way that she really was interacting with them was by kind of feeling them out with bugs because she didn't have yeah. sight still. Okay, so let's yeah let's let's do it on air. Mm-hmm. So uh, we we cut back and there's a, some various conversations with the Chicago wards and some other characters uh, where uh, Taylor, you know, she's she's blind at this point. So the only way that she's able to see anything at all about them is putting bugs on them. She at, at best she can get the roughest estimation of of mm-hmm. posture or direction that someone is looking, but not the even tone is a little bit difficult uh, to tell. Yeah, it's really it's it, it's it's so odd too because like we keep forgetting, you know, the audience. Yeah. Oh, or perhaps I don't know. Perhaps you have it in your head, but I feel like I kept no, forgetting. No, no, I definitely yeah. Because she is like, I mean, she's talking about their movements and all of this, so it's like you don't really think about it, right? It's like um, well, in the interlude with Brew, where we see her, he he's like looking at her walk across the street and not look side to side, or she's just kind of quietly right. looking ahead, and he knows it's because she's kind of feeling out. You know, it's this very, I don't know, it's, it just boggles my mind that no one knows at this moment, <laughs> you know? And then it's also this whole thing of like, she can't get any of the nuances of human interaction, right? She can't see the like changes in expression or, you know, uh, positioning of their bodies. What is that? Body? What is that? Posture. Posture. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Posture. And, and, but she's still like hyper aware of who's speaking and kind of where they are in terms of spatial positionality, right? Yeah. You know? Um, so then suddenly, like, her brain, while usually try, try she usually tries to make um, a bit of effort, you know, in the emotional, social bits, all of that, now she, like, her tactical reasoning is, like, hyper attend, like, is getting yeah. this, like, full attention, right? Yeah, it's kind of, uh, going blind has strengthened her combat senses a lot, mm-hmm. but cut her off from emotions. Um she went blind at the start of the cold conflict, so I kind of analogize that to getting tunnel vision, basically. Yeah. Uh, and she doesn't regain it until she's pulled out of Noel, and basically, like the only break. Yeah. I mean, there's Wait, the break so between Coil and Noel. Does she not Noel, see but... when she kills Coil? I don't think she does. That's interesting. Oh, I did not something that think about easily that, forgotten. But that's yeah. really. I feel like that's an important huh. point. Yeah. Because, because she has this this sort of hyper awareness in the tactical sense and kind of lets the emotional bit go to like to wayside or whatever right so she her pro like i guess that that i feel like her her kind of caustic attitude in the Mm -hmm. aftermath of that i think makes more sense now yeah also all of that happened yesterday oh my god that's (laughs) true that's true i forget about how like everything is happening the 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 reason I flashed to that is because I was remembering the confrontation after the underside just think that she betrayed them, and Imp you know just kicking the shit out of her yeah. and you know basically wanted to kill her and that that was that was yesterday so yeah and they haven't it's yeah I feel like they, it's been an emotional they don't roller sleep for like a while no no they all don't. of them and they no. have this whole conversation where they're like well here we go I don't know it just if I feel like there's just a huge amount of stress happening. Yeah, there's. I think there's one bit where uh, there. It, it might be during the um, hour break after Noel gets a building collapsed on her mm-hmm. uh, between um, uh, the beginning of Arc 19, where they drive to Skitter's territory so she can get Atlas, and she's like dozes off a little bit in the car, yes. but not like entirely, mm-hmm. and it's just like 
I, I've, I've, you know, traveled sometimes and there's been times where like I was that exhausted too, but you know, it just, we just had to keep going. The, the travel plans like didn't mm-hmm. let us, you know, have a, a good rest. And that kind of extremely tired twilight s- sleep in a stressful situation, um, I don't know. I, I, I don't even know what I'm getting at. I just know that I, I know that feeling and yeah, yeah. it resonated. Um, it's just, yeah, I, I, the, the timeline, I think you, you forget because so much happens in the moments that you like, I feel like, I feel like there isn't a moment to decompress until way later. Yeah. And um, when she goes to see her mother, I think is really the first time that she's like taken a breath mm-hmm. in this whole kind of like section of arcs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so then the Chicago Wards and the other siders start fighting clones. Mm-hmm. Uh, Taylor's bugs are chopping up arteries. Yeah, um, wild. There's like, super vicious. some deaths that, mm-hmm, there's some very fast deaths that, you know, take just basically, some of the times she, she, she kills people as fast as like the Slaughterhouse Nine mm-hmm. did, basically. Yeah. Um, and Taylor is recognizing the tactics of Noel, uh, placing um, in, individual use, useful individuals um, to carry out maximum damage while also being the heavy hitter at the center, aka mm-hmm. exactly Skitter's tactics, except uh, <laughs> much better in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah, so. I feel like she says better, but I feel like it's just like a larger scale. You know, like oh, if yeah. she had that amount of capability, she would be just like just as much of like it, you know. What if I mean? her bugs had superpowers, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, wild. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the the combat here is is exceedingly violent. Where I mean, we're working with Vistas here, and Vistas' power is not super, you know, in your face violent. And yet, because of the radiation twist, one character just instantly has a death sentence. One, one of our heroes, yeah, oh my and God, that whole, that chests a lot. are being caved in, and yeah, it's really it's very violent. Yeah, the the fighting of, of Noel and like everybody is is almost like immediately very violent but then there's like this whole other aspect to it i think um that makes it so difficult i think because because it is like noel right mm-hmm. and in their mind i mean the the individual that they're fighting is is really very different than noel but then i don't know it's it's very like complicated i think in terms of like their mentality of approaching the fight yeah yeah um i don't know if this is exactly the right moment here but uh, we can talk about evil clones a bit. Mm, yes. Um, so, I mean, first, I, I mean, the first thing I want to say is just just the fact that Wild Bo can put evil clones and kaiju in a story and it doesn't feel at all like a cliche. Yeah, it's just yeah. brilliant. Um, uh, but so, of course, there's there's the, the the question there, like, is it OK to be you know, killing these clones like this. There's there's that moment later on where uh, they're they're chasing after Noel. Noel uh, basically picks up a bunch of random people mm-hmm. and pukes them out immediately. And you know, the, the, there's a short conversation between Taylor and these evil clones, and they're like just horror. They they seem to be in such a, like a horrible mental state. But repeatedly, mm-hmm. we get signs yeah. that I mean, they are thinking, feeling beings. They might be extremely, uh, basically yeah, evil. All of them have but... like a to do list that's like. Kill friends and family, but then like yeah. beneath that, they're like, "Here is all of my f- like these pains and and aches and heartaches and loneliness and all of this that I haven't processed." Yeah. But now that I have you know no filter, here is all of that for you to examine. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like that it it makes it really difficult. I think because she has to keep reminding herself. She like she like mentally goes through in her head where she's like, "These are not people," you know, like or, or yeah. with a little dash, you know, not people. Yeah. I mean, on on the other hand, like, you know, definitely, they definitely needed to die, yeah, right? Yeah, they, I mean, they, they barely win cause... as is without holding back mm-hmm. at all. So I, I definitely don't blame any of the heroes or the undersiders for, yeah, for yeah. killing these clones. Their actions but, are justified. Yeah. But it's it's still, the, the morality of it is definitely questionable. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think really the, the truly evil thing is Noel's power. Uh, because it's just creating these basically these cursed beings that are doomed to suffer, right? Yeah. yeah. Like they are created in, a, in this horrible mental state, and there's no way that they'll recover, and they'll only wreak suffering. And it just makes me wonder about like uh, uh, other stories where you know that has these sort of evil creatures, mm-hmm. right? Like you know the orcs in Lord of the Rings and whatnot. I, I where they trouble me he, greatly. He, 
you know? Yeah, well, it makes me... Mm -hmm. This is... I know I, like, bring up Aragon all the time, and I don't know why, because I haven't read that book in, like, at least 10 years. Uh -huh. But I feel like you would really like it, because, mm -hmm. I mean, it's slightly derivative, because he, like, wrote it when he was, like, 15 or whatever, but um, he has a similar kind of, like, group of individuals that are kind of like orcs. Right. But um, the main character, like, goes and hangs out with him for a while and, like, learns the way that they work and, and like, their whole culture. And, like, it, I don't know, it really, like, kind of, you know, subverts that, that whole, like, you know, writing them off as, as, like, oh, the... Evil creatures. Yeah, evil creatures that are, you know, here to assist some great being. Yeah. 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 I think that's definitely, like, a something to bring up is this... Yeah, well, the the, the question that this made me think about is is something evil if they're only mm -hmm. carrying out their nature or is that the definition of evil because everything else is just like just bad circumstances and and bad upbringing right like not even i'm not even talking about determinism now right yeah. but like if something has been formed to be evil like they they didn't have any choice at all in a matter yeah, right yeah. like like these clones like the orcs and whatnot they're carrying out evil actions, but they never had any agency in, you know, becoming, you know, a, a better person. Is, are they evil or, uh, yeah, are, are, are yeah. they evil? Yes or no? Because each one is like complete. Yeah, it's difficult. Opposites. Yeah. Of direction. I feel like. Are they evil or are they innocent? That's the, that's yeah. the dichotomy there. But the question is, can they be both? Mm -hmm. You know, of like, I mean, we'll talk about it in just a second, but this whole concept of like you know, what comprises a monster, you know, like what, mm -hmm. what makes something like how, wh what are the, what are the, you know, requirements for us to label something to be evil, right? Yeah. Like, does it have to be within the mind, the like body, the soul? Like if, if these beings are like pre-programmed to kind of hold on to the worst bits of their like original selves and have this kind of pre-programmed you know, to-do list, right? Checklist. Um, are they evil until they choose not to do so? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Or, like, if they do commit those acts, like, of they go out, you know, to, like, commit murder or whatever, do they hold all the blame, or is that also assigned to, like, Noelle and her body making these things? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then does the blame... Whoever, whoever holds the blame, are they the one that is evil, or are they both evil, or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It, it reminds me of the, the question of, you know, people who have stuff that they're worried about passing on to their children. Mm, and that's yeah. sort of question that they have to face of, like, I, I mean, I, again, Noelle is not really, you know, thinking about that question. She's, she's got other priorities, yeah, right? Yeah. But, like, is it all okay for me to bring something like this in, into the world? And you, she's just creating them constantly right like every t you know 10 minutes she creates like 20 or whatever yeah. and it's just the it's, it's such a irresponsible creation of life i oh, think it's terrible yeah yeah this yeah huh it's very much worse than children because it's just so unthinking so quick for i mean it and some of them it takes seconds you know mm -hmm. and they're like half thought out i don't know yeah yeah, Noelle's a fascinating discussion. I think she brings up she her just her like her whole like presence. Yeah, I guess it, not presence, but like mm -hmm. you know situational self. I think. What do you mean by situational self? I guess because we we know her like background, right? But then like I don't know. It's just what she had, like what she has become, right? Like her the pieces of herself that like are mixed with this being that is her. I don't know. It's just. Mm -hmm. It's ah, I I don't even know how to just like put it into words. Well, we'll we'll have more about it when we get to her interludes. So yeah, yeah. you can save it for then. So then we have um, Jessica Yamada's interlude, the therapist mm -hmm. for the wards, uh, and uh, yeah. So we we have Jessica y Yamada's interlude. She uh, we we start off with her talking to. Victoria, or what's happened to Victoria. Yes. Um, then we go to talk to uh, Sveta, a.k.a. Uh, Garrett. Garrett. I never know how to pronounce that word. Garrett. The Garrett just sounds wrong. Garrett. So Is I it Garrett? You know, anyway, 
Anyway, but Sveta. <laughs> uh, and then the the latter half has to do with talking with uh, many of the wards in turn, uh, finishing off with speaking to Eidolon, who Yamada describes as mm-hmm. uh, one of the real monsters. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting because she, Yamada, like, she she's kind of placed in, she, she doesn't have the kind of camaraderie, right? She can't, like, offer that as, like, a lowering the barrier of entry sort of thing into these, like, conversations because... I mean, she hasn't been totally there, right? That's they call her out on that, and she hasn't. She doesn't fully understand, or she doesn't. She di- she can't fully like understand everything they've been through, right? But then, like, she very she so like very deliberately like creates like trust. I think between yeah. all of them, it's really interesting, especially especially um, Garot, I suppose Garrett. However, I you could just say Sveta. Sveta. That, yeah. um, because I don't know. It to me, I don't know. Just she's she's so like caring and it's i mean she i mean she puts herself like in danger and everything but i don't know it was a nice gesture but but what i wanted wanted to bring up about her kind of this like little background um like commentary in her mind about idolin Mm -hmm. um which i think i feel like that um that kind of conversation about how how sveta does not have control over her body or she has very little control right um that there is this sort of separation of of the acts that her body commits and her mind, you know? Right. And I feel like I feel like the definition that Yamada places of monster, like Eidolon is a monster, rather than Sveta, I think, is important because it's about like choice. Yeah. You know? Is not is not a label that has been placed upon Eidolon. Like Although yeah. The, I suppose the, she though, she question... places it upon him. Yeah, what I wonder though is it, she views him as a monster. Why? Mm. It, yeah, like, yeah. Because yeah. he's not a murderer, right? I, I, I mean, he's extremely powerful and a little bit inhuman, right? He does the extreme, you know, violation of of privacy by uh, going back through her past three days um, and other things. That's true. Uh, but it's but, also but he's not. She I, I mean, she he's in culture, but she doesn't know. Yeah, yeah. Very intriguing. Why she has like come to this conclusion mm-hmm. yeah i don't know yeah just I, I guess just people that are are so powerful and um yeah i don't know there was i feel like somebody else brings up the concept where his his uh, one of the chicago wards i think um grace is like mm-hmm. you know the the undersiders i think are like kind of twisting or, or to her they seem to be twisting like his reasons for what he's doing right and then yeah she's like his reasons are for like you know he's doing the right thing he's doing good you know and then she's like you guys twist everything right and then um, i think regent you know is like oh haha yes but um <laughs> you know as regent does but yeah, right, 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 it was just yes. um it was notable i think because because that reason of like you know he's doing it for good or like for the greater good kind of leaves out the like the other side of that explanation of like mm-hmm. it that sort of that sort of justification leaves room for like collateral damage that can be kind of brushed away. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which can like I don't know. I feel like is is something that that the like the governmental good can kind of let spin out of control. You know, like with Arms Master. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I don't know. Perhaps perhaps it's something about like Yamada's definition of monster is like someone who does not see the effects of like does not feel the remorse of the actions that they take you know or yeah. like and he's just very like ungrounded i think is another thing yeah. he's just very very separated from humanity mm-hmm. yeah yeah uh, of course we could talk, talk about so much from uh, yamana is truly this it's something worthy of like 45 to an hour um yes. oh my god this whole of, interview of talk just so because yeah every single character is is worth talking about mm-hmm. one, one little thing just um i remember you asking why didn't they make panacea go to you know a normal prison and we mm-hmm. have that answered at the beginning here with uh yamada telling victoria that uh they were afraid of um her releasing some terrible plague and murdering everyone yeah so they kind of had to but uh Oh. Yeah, and, and then there's there's so much else. We're going to talk a lot about names later on. Yes, um, yes. Once you know Weaver comes comes about, but 
Names. Yes. Names and clothes. Both of those things in this particular set of arcs were just like so important, I think. Mm hmm. Yes. Yes. And we will have moments for them. Mm hmm. Uh, okay, let's let's continue Onward. forward. So there's some more fighting. Um, Eidolon is, is is fighting Noel, that sort of thing. But we'll, we're we're gonna skim over that mm -hmm. uh, before the travelers appear. And for a second, it it does feel like okay, this is gonna be some of the final confrontation moments. Sundancer is probably gonna use her orb. You know, Noel's kind of pinned in place. But then Noel um, appeals to Trickster's uh, loyalty and mm -hmm. his his guilt. And he switches sides. He betrays them. He switches people around. Uh, Brian and, and Skidder both are consumed by Noel, and basically everything goes wrong. Yeah. Mm. Uh, trickster. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, say what you want about him. He's ill-motivated. He makes the wrong calls. He's an asshole. Uh, he, you know, guilt-tripped uh, Noel a lot. Mm. But he is loyal. So he is loyal, but I feel like his that. loyalty is <laughs> very misplaced. Yeah, like he's blindly loyal, almost. I would say mm -hmm. is that he doesn't. I mean, he, definitely, like there's like the you know the whole guilt aspect to it, and his like previous you know sort of attraction towards her. But I feel like I don't know. I feel like he doesn't. He he isn't able to like fully acknowledge how like far gone she is. Yeah, it, I mean, it reminds me of just his thought processes regarding the breakup right yes of like he's choosing first he, he's choosing something that's not really there mm -hmm. he's loyal to something that's not really existing that the relationship the the thing that he wanted does not exist right neither of them were were truly happy yeah. so he's just like choosing to care so much about noel and things like that but like there's not really any um like emotional or or logical like ground for that to to, to come out of it's yeah, not it's yeah. not a natural loyalty it's not over the course of you know many over the course of their two years of traveling around uh, earth bed that they you know grew even closer or anything like that no i mean it, they only possibly could have grown further apart and more contentious in their relationship with each other yeah well because it yet, seems like there's so much placation yeah 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 it's i mean yeah it's it's a very I don't know. I, I I don't know if high school is the right kind of term for it. Oh, but it I would reminds say definitely. Me. Like it, it has really, yeah. It has the like foolish idealism of high school relationship to me. Yeah, like, of like not fully thinks, acknowledging the reality of what's happening. Yeah, that this is what you're supposed to do with someone mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you're supposed to be in love with. Yeah, like obligatory actions and and kind of this like narrative that doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. So we have an interlude here with, uh, first is the interlude from Faultline's perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, they're searching for answers about Case 53's and Cauldron. Uh, they go, they break into the quarantine zone in, in Madison, actually, uh, picking up a Case 53 there and asking some questions about uh, Cauldron. Um, when they get back to their hotel, Tattletail calls about Labyrinth, and that's a setup for something we're going to see at the end of Arc 19. Uh, before they were attacked by an agent of Cauldron with a yes. fedora. As a warning, of course. Yes, yes. I'm very intrigued by this agent of Cauldron. But also, mm -hmm. I really like um, the whole group's like dynamic. I mean, I liked them previously, too, when we saw them like in um, uh, Gregor's interlude. And, and uh, we had one from Labyrinth, right? Or perhaps that was... Yeah, that yes. was Labyrinth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I don't know. They just, like, I like their, their grouping. But I wanted to mention that um, Faultline has this whole like little inventory mm -hmm. um, that she kind of like sorts through, right? Um, and it was really yeah. interesting because it feels very much like Taylor's kind of systematic way yeah. of kind of, you know, uh, categorizing information and like, you know, kind of checking in on everything. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. And then additionally, which is a total side note, but I feel like it's something that really needs to be brought up because it's fucking amazing. Um, is when they're like getting ready and she puts her like ponytail in, but it's actually uh -huh. like, like got spikes, fucking in it. spikes. Oh my God. Yeah. That's, I <laughs> loved that. That was great. Yeah. It really shows how serious she is about this. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. This is a, some extra textual information, but so Wildbow, uh, spent a good amount of time before 
starting Worm, just write, basically attempting to write Worm. Mm -hmm. There's, um, I think, something like, probably like 20 drafts or something like that of uh, different first couple chapters and, and things. I, I, I think the original, well, maybe I shouldn't say the original title because it's uh, a foreshadowing of something that... Um, you should know yet, but so some of the main characters, it, the, the main character had not been chosen yet. Mm. It was actually, I think, supposed to be a, a rotating cast, but one um, was Faultline, actually. Uh, another was um, both Victoria and um, Amy, and um, oh, that would have been a very overwhelming story. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would have. That was supposed to be called Guts and Glory, which uh, is. A really fun, that is. fun name, um, and then then some other characters as well. I think Circus was one of them. Oh, um, Circus, yes, which is a very very minor character in this version yeah, of the, yeah. the story, at least up to this point. Um, yeah, I think Taylor actually was a pretty like later mm-hmm. um, choice of a character. But yeah, I just thought that was interesting. Oh, that is um, okay. So, mm-hmm. sorry, we can keep going. <laughs> no, that's all right. Uh, so the next interlude is uh, Noelle's. And it's – so we see from her perspective that she's sort of in control of her body. She is planning mm-hmm. things, but she's completely overwhelmed with the biological emotions that are, are flooding her body, right? The endorphins, yeah. The, yeah. the adrenaline. And uh, she keeps getting subsumed in these visions of, of her past, right? Some of them are happy. Some of them are not. Uh, she yes. Is she being subsumed yeah. or is she being deliberately shown these things? That's a good question. Because, like – is she is she receiving like this sort of like because because both with both Brian and Taylor when they're in the you know kind of you know belly of the beast so to say um, they also have these sorts of things right except I mean there's much more like twisted and all of this right but it seems like this to her this keeps occurring right that this is I don't know I don't yeah. know if it's like a deliberate it, uh, perhaps yeah. I, I wonder how often she had these visions before she broke out of the vault. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. She's kind of stuck in her own mind with somebody else there yeah. who doesn't want to be there. Yeah. It's terrible. So we see some of her past, right? Uh, mm-hmm. We see that, that breakup this time from, from her perspective uh, and how she's always had this sort of um, – she's always had an eating disorder of some type. Um, yeah. And also, that's, her you know, deeply ironic like... at this point. That is, it's it's very interesting. But also, you know, is that a reflection of? I mean, I guess because her trigger event wasn't really like, it wasn't meant to happen. But mm-hmm. there is definitely like an interaction, right, of of power and person. So was there some sort of like interaction there in her headspace, mm-hmm. or the like? Are the powers prescribed? So like, whoever the passenger is, just kind of is like, yeah. I guess this is what I got to do, you know? Yeah. I don't know. How does it adapt to a, a specific host? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Sorry, I keep interrupting and, you as you're like going no, through no, your No, 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 that's totally, that's totally right. She has um, that, that – she she goes along that, that train of thought as well, thinking about, yeah, how perhaps she was not destined to get this specific power. Yeah. yeah. Well, because she, she has – she saw like the, the memory of – her passenger, didn't she? Mm-hmm. Where it's kind of like the the destiny has been disrupted, sort of thing, which makes me wonder right. about like all the passengers that are in all the cauldron people's heads. You know, like, yeah. are they all also misplaced? Like, even the ones that it kind of like worked out with, like, are they also? Did they also have somebody else in mind? But then it didn't happen, you know, naturally, or you know, kind of in in you know the. Uh, I don't, I don't want to say like in situ, but like you know, in the place, right? You know, in mm-hmm. in the it, it was it was artificially produced. Like, are they all also like misplaced? Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know. I have a lot of wondering. Um, <sighs> so the the last the things I have here are just of like how she she really is slowly getting consumed by her own body, mm-hmm. and I think she only she she realizes that herself, and it's this kind of. Um, helpless desperation that she can't. She's she's sliding down this this trail and she can't s- stop yeah. at all. She only she I mean she only wants to return to Noble, but she can't. She can't. So she lashes out. Yeah, it's I don't know. It's just I feel like the entirety of the traveler's tale is very like yeah. is very tragic, mostly because like yeah. 
it's almost, they almost kind of know. Like, I mean, they have this hope that they're holding out for like a solution to everything, right? But yeah. it's like, it's so ill-fated from the beginning, you know, and they, they emerge from, from the Seamurg's influence, right? So they have that sort yeah. of hanging over their head this entire time where they kind of know that there will be some sort of fate that is not great at the end, I suppose. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, they were bas- they basically refused um received a prophecy yeah. at that moment. Yeah, so she yeah, she's this I, I mean, Noel in particular is this poor girl mm-hmm. consumed and being consumed basically by like a mental illness. Yeah. Like that's kind of I I think it's very easily analogized to real life where it's mm-hmm. a, a mental illness that you cannot or for some reason could not get help for and it just gets worse and worse until friends and family you know, can't even recognize her. Yeah. And so, so they keep saying that it's not her anymore. And they're sort of right, but they're also wrong because she is there. Mm-hmm. That That is her. There's an unbroken connection between the her of, Hen- the her of now and the her of two years ago before this. Um, and it, like, especially when they're, when they're talking about it, about it being not her, ballistic, right, multiple times but before the section talks about, oh, Noel wouldn't, you know, be able to regenerate from getting hit with a bullet or whatever. Yeah. Where it's like, okay, well, then that means that most parahumans aren't who they were anymore. That's not a very good argument. But he's just like grasping for some reason to some physical, visual reason to not have to categorize her as the girl he once knew. Yeah. 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 It's just very painful to watch. Yeah. And, and related. So a trickster is someone who only wants who who wants to help, mm-hmm. but only hurts ever. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, he did that in the relationship, too. He wants to help her, but it just makes her even more guilty. And he's, you know, helping Noel now to trying to save her. But in doing so, he he's giving her more masks, more clones and mm-hmm. basically just letting her slide deeper and deeper into uh, con- control by her power. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's very much like, I feel like it's, I, I said that it was illustrative of like the wreckage of an unequal love, but I feel like it's also, mm-hmm. he is the one that like, is there that is seemingly like trying to help, but the one who isn't totally helping, who who doesn't recognize the situation as it is, you know, mm-hmm. like I, it's not a category of person, but like when someone I feel like is suffering, like who's battling a mental illness, I think that is like so totalizing i think yeah sometimes i feel like there is like an individual who doesn't acknowledge like the the like the amount of help that needs to yeah. be provided you know that is yeah. kind of like like enabling nothing but like you know like unhealthy coping me- mechanisms or something like that yeah i feel like i feel like he's kind of that person for her for sure where he yeah. he feels like he he is helping like that that is his intention but the the reality of it isn't what his expectation is yeah he thinks he's basically enough to save her yeah and he's not at all so uh we then get into arc 19 scourge in which uh everybody shows up noel wrecks everyone and everything goes wrong until taylor waves the red cape uh for the bull to charge and Mm -hmm. tattletale goes full mastermind so we open here with taylor having visions while stuck in the belly of echidna uh, this we start off with a high school hell warped and mixed up, um, like nightmares, uh, among some other ones. Mm-hmm. But you all, we also get visions of uh, what's going on outside of Echidna through her bugs. Um, so we see some Taylor clones attacking Tattletail, uh, which are disturbing because they're not entirely dissimilar from Taylor. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's very interesting too, because like the the conversation that they have with Taylor. Or particular, I think one particular one especially, where it's like, there's all these moments that Taylor chooses not to push Tattletail, like chooses not to push Lisa, right? Mm-hmm. But then all, like the Taylor clones, like they don't have that, you know, inhibition, right? Like they don't have that, that whatever, you know, holding, like, you know, kind of dictating that, that maybe they shouldn't ask this, right? Where, I don't know, I feel like it, there's... I don't know. It just they there's there's not enough distance, I think, between mm-hmm. the skitter clones and like her mind. Yeah, they're just uh, like 
some of these things, right? Talking the the way they talk to Taylor, talking about the the secrets and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I almost think that just Taylor on a really bad day would could say basically the exact same thing. Yes. Yeah. Not in a murderous way, but yeah, would say no, the same thing. There wouldn't be like this, like you know, th- yeah, there wouldn't be the murder, you know, undertones. But I mm-hmm. of of the clones that have you know kind of had a chat with everybody else. I feel like hers are the ones that are closest to, like, her, like, their, their kind of feelings are closest to, like, the ones that she shows, I guess. Like, there isn't, there mm-hmm. isn't a, a strong, like, with Alexandria, like, she wouldn't have, you know, had that whole, like, long thing, you know, if it was just her, actually her, right? Like, there is, yeah. her, her barrier is much stronger, but I feel like Taylor is, doesn't have that, I guess. Yeah. But, um, yeah. It, so, uh, to talk about, um, Taylor's dreams. Mm-hmm. Um, we see how her past mistakes are really, really haunting her. She feels like she can't save anyone, and the dream's sole motivation is basically to grind her down and make her give up. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, so she's cut out uh, by Weld, and it, there's a great moment there. And most of them are able to escape, but not before Shatterbird is freed from within the the, the bowels of. Um, Coil's base and not under Regent's control because he has only just been cut out of Ikin as well and she screams. She does. Yes. Ah. Oh mm-hmm. my god. This is very exciting. Mostly because Shatterbird shows up and also Cherish shows up later and so I was just getting very excited about all of this. <laughs> you know. Um, Maybe you can get the the gang back together. The I don't know. There's gang. just too many people that have died. You know. Mm-hmm. The other two were well, like silicone. I mean, we we get some signs that that's not going to be as big a problem as as um, yeah. It seems like there's a, going to be a, a mess, barrier. which I'm very excited about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I shouldn't be because there's probably going to be a lot of death and like you know murders <laughs> and bloody things, but like they're fun. I mean, in like a yes. twisted sort of way, you know. Oh, for sure, for sure. We'll we'll get into that that later on yeah, as well. Yeah. Uh, so I also want to mention here that there's actually a secret interlude uh, at this point. Um, I, I won't tell you to to read until after a worm mm-hmm. because this is worm as it's supposed to be published. Uh, but he released a chapter here from the perspective of a clone of Tattletale, mm-hmm. um, but was unsatisfied with the result and I think basically deleted it a couple hours after posting it or something. Yeah. Um, so it's now it's a kind of sort of pseudo canon where like we see. Um, I'm going to spoil a bit, but we see Shadowbird's um, backstory, basically. And uh, oh. that her backstory is canon, but I don't think the actions that happen in that particular section are. So, oh. um, but yeah, I just thought it was interesting. Oh, to that mention. is. Oh, that's so interesting. Mm-hmm. Ah, I really, I like that concept of being able to see in the perspective of a clone. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, yeah, we get, sure. like, when we get... The interludes, and you know, we see kind of in the minds of people, but like unfettered. That would be a really interesting read, I think. Yes. So mm. uh, the undersiders get out and blow up the entire base. Um, there's a, a point here where Tattle tells about a punch in the code, where then Miss Militia stops her, and Tattle lets Miss Militia, um, you know, d- decide whether she or Tattletail will push the button and Miss Militia ta- decides to take responsibility and do it herself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ah. Uh, you know, I really like her, Miss Militia. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I mean, later on she gets kind of, you know, kind of non-action-y, but I feel like everything that she does is very deliberate, you know? Like, sometimes yes. with the PRT people and, like, the protect, like, I feel like they're kind of, um, I, I want to use, um, like a shotgun analogy, but I don't know enough about guns to fully articulate <laughs> it. But whichever one is like, you know, where it kind of like breaks into a bunch of things or, you uh-huh. know, you try a bunch of different things. It's some idiom that people use, but I don't know the idiom. Okay. I don't know. Oh, just a shotgun style approach. I guess so. I think, I think that's Which what is it is. Because it's shotguns, um, uh, I forget the, it might just be shotgun shells, but not slugs. Slugs are the other one. Anyway, where they shoot actually a bunch of like little, little yeah. tiny. I feel like or sometimes pellets. their actions are like that, but she doesn't have like she doesn't have that sort of you know kind of try everything approach. Like to me, when she makes a decision, she makes a decision, you know, mm-hmm. and she she acts upon it. She takes responsibility for it, you know. She she holds herself accountable. I think. Yeah. You know, in her mind. Yeah. 
Miss Militia, uh, Weld, and Yamada are three of the most commonly um, cited as, like, capital G good characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I just thought that was another interesting thing. Uh, So here we actually see multiple conversations. Taylor has a conversation with Miss Miss Militia and and Weld after her clone admitted to killing uh, Thomas Calvert, um, a.k.a. Coyle. And Miss Militia decides not to give them a kill order for now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So this, this, so there's there's multiple conversations with with Miss Militia here. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's the one where Taylor is asking Miss Militia to help them fight Echidna. This the one around with Clock Blocker. This one where Taylor admits to killing Coil. And then later, of course, the conversation with, with Flechette and Parian. And of course, the one where she turns herself in. Yeah. yeah. And through all of these, we get a pretty pretty damn good picture of who Miss Militia is, yeah. right? It, just as you said, right, upholding the law, but wanting more than anything to do the right thing, right? She She's actually, actually, like, ex- exceedingly empathetic with Skitter. Like, mm-hmm. she, you know, she asks about evidence and, and other things. She, she's working within the system, but, like, other than that, basically, he's almost always assuming that Taylor is telling the truth or trying to tell the truth or something yeah, like that. she, it. like, gives her space to explain yeah. Without kind of needling her all the way through. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so then Taylor goes, uh, Tattletail makes Taylor go and get healed finally. We go see Scapegoat, um, <sighs> as Clarence wrote, an interdimensional flipbook of selves to be the best, acquiring the injuries of others. Uh, this is the moment most of the people in that earlier powwow about Noel realize that Skitter has been blind. So it's a hilarious moment. <laughs> She's fucking blind. Ah, uh, it's, it's pretty good. I don't. It just. It's. I don't know. It's just very amusing to me that like nobody like notices, you know. And she's just yeah. so like self assured, you know. And then scapegoat kind of is like. Also, scapegoat's power seems kind of horrible. Like yeah. it's marketable, you he know. He can power. like you know make money off of it because everyone's you know that's convenient for others but like it seems really hellish for him you know Mm -hmm. because like he's kind of stuck i mean he's because he takes on their injuries yes he he can give his injury to someone else is the other that's what they do with one of the clones later on there's a moment there that that makes it then that's the problem is that if someone receives lethal injuries he's got to take the lethal injury and then give it to someone else so i don't know it just seems like He's always feeling the pain of others. It's like, yeah, like in Star Trek, you know the the like Betazoids, you know, um, well, which I don't. They, <laughs> it, they're they're like a type of alien. Um, there's like a counselor in in Next Generation that's a Betazoid, but like she can feel the emotions of other people, ah. and like like a visceral feeling of others' emotions, not just reading them. Um, but like I feel like it's his. It's like that all the time, right? He's just kind of like, I mean, he can give it to other people, I suppose, which makes it better, but just like constantly taking on, he is a space for other people's pain all the time, but it's like yeah, this visceral, I don't know. And then it's also additionally like when he kind of takes on everything um, that she's feeling, like he he's kind of like thrown for a loop for a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I feel like, I feel like I'm remembering the scene correctly, but it's like how much was she really caring? Like, how much did she just kind of, you know, decide to not, you know, to, to kind of, like, put on the back burner, you know? Like, how much physical pain oh, yeah. was she carrying around that had become normal to her? I mean, the coil thing happened yesterday, right? Yeah, so, so she's still, like, walking lot. around with all of that shit, like, in, you know, yeah. I don't know. And then, like, before the coil, like, there's so much that she has kind of taken on. Yeah. In a really short amount of time, and she hasn't had the time to kind of. I mean, I mean, the conversation. There's multiple conversations with her and Brian where Brian's just like mad because she isn't taking care of her physical self. You know, yeah. I don't know. It just it it seems like a lot. Yeah. Uh, so then uh, Taylor approaches Brian, who is basically um, basically not comatose, but he you yeah. know he's got a thousand not um, yard stare. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she basically she convinces Aisha to take Brian away to recover. Uh, you know he relived his trigger events probably both in the belly of a kidna that did not go well. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then assuming because uh, and, we mm-hmm. saw that that like Taylor's visions also right were like 
very like warped and kind of mixed up. I assume that his were yeah, also even worse. Yeah, really like even more so warped and and kind of mixed up and very nightmarish. Mm-hmm. Which I don't know how such things could become even more nightmarish, but yeah, yeah. But it's really interesting. Um, I think the conversation that Taylor has with Aisha, um, which I reading your your note, I think it, it does make me like reconsider it, but it still feels as if Taylor has set up, she has given Aisha two options, but has kind of, you know, set her down on a particular path. So she like, she creates something yeah. that feels like a choice, but is actually an order. Yeah. You know? I, I mean, she goes basically, uh, yeah, I, you know, um, you could go killing around assassinating. That would be really good. And then, you know, lose out on the field commander, the one that can actually tell people what to do and, and stuff. Or, you know, just that that sounds super reasonable. Or you can go and I will stay and lead and, you know, be a pretty good, you know, coordinator and commander. Yeah. And It almost uh, feels you know, a little trickstery, leader. you know? Hmm? Like, it almost feels kind of how trickster would, mm. like, would manipulate people into doing yeah. what he wanted them to do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. That said, in her narration, she does say that she like aches to be yeah, with him, that's very even true. though she she does basically make the decision herself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so uh, then the triumvirate ar- arrive, uh, or the rest of them, uh, Alexandria and Legend, um, Tecton and Taylor talk about leadership styles. Uh, uh, oh yeah, because Tecton's the like, of, oh yeah, you know, like we should trust in you know my superior. He has this thing, and she's like, "What are you talking about?" Yeah, and, and it's, it's totally I, thrown I for a loop. It's it, she, her reaction is very un, unreasonable there because it's not even like the bureaucracy of like. It, so the the moment here is uh, Tekton is trusting that I think Mirden is going to take care of of Raymond yeah, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it was sure that there's like gonna a... be medical care. So it's not it's not even like uh, some PRT you know random person uh, talking about how best to fight a villain or whatever, right? Mm. It's medical care and it's one of the, it's an individual hero, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It, it really shows how extreme Taylor's pers- perspective is. But I suppose is. also like her like you you know, I suppose you don't really think about it quite as much, but like she is like hyper hyper micromanager, right? Oh yeah. Because like if she isn't going along to do the thing herself, she will send bugs to yeah, I mean, make sure power, that right? that happens. Her power is to micromanage. Yeah, yeah, so I feel like to him, he's kind of like, I don't, like, what are you talking about? We have to rely on other people. We have to create this trust. And she's like, I can't do that. I have to make sure that it actually happens. I don't know. It's just very different, very different perspectives. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. There was yeah. also a moment that I don't remember where it is. And I don't remember who she nods to. But I, I know that there's a moment around here where she kind of nods in this sort of like silence for acknowledgement where she acknowledged like to herself before we were saying, oh, she lies to herself because she, you know, like in the whole like the whole interaction where um, she was trying to like you know, kind of dictate the the like first aid and all of this um, to her people in like her territory. But like now yeah. she has she's doing she's kind of emulating Marquis in, in this kind of like she knows that she doesn't know. But like she doesn't want them to know. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, I think through this section especially, we really uh, see her using Marquis's strategy of of silence more and more. Mm-hmm. Not that she got it from him because she hasn't interacted yeah, with, very, with like, him at all. Yeah, it's very like unknowingly parallel. But, yeah, there's there's a lot of moments where she chooses to be silent, especially as we go into uh, Arc Twenty and beyond. And during that argument, there's multiple times where she just like smiles. Yeah, and that's exactly what Marquis would do. So. Ah, uh, oh, then, her smiling. So ah, mm-hmm, yes. Mm-hmm. So then we see Tattletoe's plan, uh, which is to tear a hole in dimensions using Scrub, the the kid from the Merchants. I'm glad that they've kind of like adopted him, because I was kind of worried about him. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Huh. Yes. Yeah. Also. So d- yeah, do you have any comments on portal so or many comments, dimensional stuff? But also, I don't know. Um, I really want to know how it works. And, like, the other dimensions, how many other dimensions are there? And, like, are they all different iterations of Earth? You know? And, like, is it just, like, every single moment of, like, are they all parallel? Are they all, like, accessible, you know? Like, is there some that... But then also, like, the ones that don't have humans on them, like, what happened? Or, like, or is there some other planet mm-hmm. that has, like, a huge amount of species and they're all, like, under the same genus? Or, like, 
you know, how many iterate, like, you know, are there other, <laughs> other, other, you know, ways that evolution went along that suddenly you know, yeah. there's different ways that, that the earth developed and like, you know, I don't know, so many questions, so many questions. None of those were actually what I wrote down. There's other questions about, <laughs> you know, like the places that labyrinth constructs, you know, and like yeah. the pocket dimensions and like those, that little, you know, kind of buckety type thing that I feel like, I don't remember if it's, it's Mirrodin, right? Who can like, who like. Yeah. He has yeah, little yeah. pocket dimensions. Where is, yeah. What is that? Where is that? You know, like, is that accessible? <laughs> And then also, are they going to, like, yeah. fuck up the other place? Like, they're like, oh, yeah, we have all these resources. You know, it's kind of like what we needed Mars to be, blah, 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 all of this. You know, but, like, are they going to mess up the other place ecologically or biologically? Like, is there some other pathogen? Or, like, they, I mean, they don't have immunity to whatever is there, right? You know, or what if there's, like, some other beast that is there that, like, you know, could have been, you know, following along the path? Or what if, is there another one that, like, has the dinosaurs that they didn't get hit by... A meteor? I have so many questions. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I, it's getting worse. I have, it's just... Huh. Yeah. Yes. These are really good speculations, and I would love to see your questions answered. <sighs> I'm going to take a sip of coffee. <laughs> that was so yeah, much. No, you didn't, you didn't write down any of no, those. No, I so didn't. I just that was go. just... <laughs> That's all right. Um, so, uh, yeah. So so then... Um, Anyways. Telltale gets into uh, several arguments with with heroes mm -hmm. mostly baiting them into talking about cauldron and uh, it culminates at least in this moment with miss militia putting uh, smacking her with with a gun and then putting the gun in her mouth um and of course later on this is echoed with alexandria putting a hand around her throat yeah. when tattletale yeah. is trying to reveal stuff about cauldron Oof. man anyways um yeah it's also it's it's very interesting because it's so like, it's very physical, the response to her words, you know, mm -hmm. like, and that happens previously, right, with Jack cutting up her face and, like, all these heroes are, like, upon her, like, they're up upon her, right, physically imposing themselves to silence her. Um, yeah. Which it's, I mean, she's just, it, it's, I feel like it proves that whole point about, like, you know, the, like, militaristic ingredient, you know, that's beneath all of her language that, you know, Kenneth Burke is writing about, like, mm -hmm. we're... They're so we're so close to a physical confrontation every time that we speak, you know. Interesting. I hadn't thought of that point before. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, it kind of goes back to this whole thing with, you know, accord. I mean, it doesn't really go back to this whole thing, but I I will bring up accord any time that I possibly can because I love him. <laughs> um, where his like oh yeah every yeah how he's moment, constantly yeah, on like, the verge of violence. Yeah. He's constantly on the urge on the verge. Man, I can't speak. Yeah, he like. He has, like, his wrecking ball solutions to, like, every single short-term problem, you know? It's like right. this, it's, a, it's like a gut reaction, you know, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I, I think this might be an interesting point here to talk about, and I, I have some more stuff here later about just, so so Taylor here and um, at the end of the uh, this arc mm -hmm. is advocating for staying silent, for corruption, for covering up crimes yes. and and yeah. cauldron influence in favor of um unity and working together to fight the real monsters yeah right? she's being very like political right now in her you know very you... like um it's not machiavelli it's like somebody later on where it's like kind of this like you know very pointedly you know aware of what she needs people to do it's very it's very yeah it's manipulative manipulative beyond individuals you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, what I find just just fascinating is how she criticizes the protector for doing stuff like this, for mm -hmm. having cauldron mm -hmm. influence, right? And yet, she's consistently argued in favor yes. of continuing yeah. that stuff. So it's like she sees the argument for it. She's like, yes, this. I mean, it makes sense to do these terrible things because the 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 end is is so necessary, right? Yeah. We need to cover th these things up because we're fighting not only Noel, but we're fighting the Endbringers and all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. And yet she's consistently trying to call them out. That That's her argument for why the PRT is terrible, right? Yeah, it's very confusing, her actions and yeah. words. I guess she, I feel yeah. like she justifies the continuing of it and the staying silent and all of that because she's like, we need this until sort of thing. Like she doesn't want mm. it to, to stay unknown. She just needs it to stay unknown just a little longer, which I feel like is a dangerous road to walk. Um, yeah. 
because that could be continuous or like indefinite you know right which i feel like i mean we don't know what's going on with legend right now um but i feel like he's kind of in that boat or at least yeah. the last time we left him he was kind of in that boat right yeah uh, so then we have um, Blasto's interlude, which is, um, it's an interlude. It's, it's <sighs> actually one of my favorites. Um, so we see how he's, um, I, I think he's Latino. He's, he speaks Spanish, mm, uh, yeah. but he's a, a, a Boston um, biological tinker, mostly with funguses and plants and, and, and animals. Mm. Uh, he's been invited by uh, Accord, and he now has this this brilliant lab in Accord's basement. Of course, Accord hates him because he's so messy. Yeah. Uh, but we, you know, we see a, a bunch of stuff on how tinkers work as he's narrating out loud. We see how the ambassadors are working. Uh, and it's really just super fascinating. And he starts making a pseudo Enbringer, which is probably not the best idea, but... Yeah. Uh, it's it's cool, whatever. He's like, well, Accord probably thought I would do it, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> uh, until <sighs> uh, Bonesaw and another Slaughterhouse Nine um, uh, damsel of distress show up before Defiant kills uh, damsel of distress, and uh, Bonesaw gives him the, the offer, you know, help help me um, or no. Blasto accepts his death, says that no, killing Bonesaw is is, is worth it. Uh, but it's all for naught because she crawls up and using her prehensile spine. Yes. Uh, while Defined is occupied, shoves her prehensile spine down his throat, takes control of his body, and, uh, makes her help him, or makes him help her escape. Yeah. Yeah. Really horrible. Really horrible. That's just, ah, Bonesaw is like so much. She's just, yeah. All the time. So, so when we did when we did how fucked up is that in I think episode four, this is one of the moments I was thinking of when I said there are things worse than mm-hmm. Brian's second trigger. To me, this is worse. That is, it's just, oh. Yeah, especially because he, I mean, he he was ready to die to sacrifice himself for this, yeah. right? Like he's yeah. already like he he came to the the decision, mm-hmm. found some nobility in it, uh, mentally at least, and then it's completely stolen from him. And he gets the worst of three worlds. He gets the, the bone saws alive. She's not dead. And he has a fate worse than death. Yeah. Ugh. Or he's not dead is what I meant to say. Ugh. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. You uh, copied a section here. Oh, yes, I did. Well, this was only like a, a lot of, a lot of um, Blaster's interlude. I just really liked the way that he thought. Yeah. You know, and kind of like the way that he was kind of sorting through things. But um, particularly, I really liked the way that he was... Um, describing reading through the like the details of the database because he mm-hmm. was he said it was like reading shakespeare um which is this is literally like the best way to describe reading shakespeare and mm-hmm. also i don't know just do, do you want to read oh, it yes yes do you want to read it out um okay uh it was like reading shakespeare one could listen to a line and be momentarily baffled but skimming it or assuming a general foundation of knowledge uh it was possible to pick up the gist of the message, the underlying meanings, if not the exact definitions of the individual elements, um, which I feel like is wonderful and beautiful. And that's how I approach many things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. It was just it was just like a really interesting description. It was a small thing, but I mm-hmm. wanted to be sure to point it out because I liked it. I liked the way that it was written. Definitely. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's very. Yeah. The, the, the description of Tinker, how Tinker's work is always, I, I, I very much enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, so then we basically have a giant battle against Noel uh, mm-hmm. that goes on for a couple chapters. Everyone is working together, and Skitter kind of picks up the slack of uh, giving directions and instructions. She actually basically ends up coordinating a lot of the fight. Yeah. Um, she tries to sk- stick close to Scapegoat uh, via Atlas, and as soon as uh, he's able to transfer those injuries elsewhere, she's immediately into the, the thick of it again. Oh, okay, okay. I think that's why I didn't understand the, the end bit of Scapegoat, because I was wondering why... Okay, okay, that makes sense, why she kind of mm-hmm. s- switched from the area of view into kind of like the thick of everything. Yeah, Weld brought over uh, mm-hmm. the... Some some clone, I think. Yeah. Also, the image of like Weld just kind of like wading through, trying to get people, <laughs> is a wonderful image that I feel like is very important to this whole fight. Yeah, yeah, he really is key to it yeah. because he's one of the few that can actually cut people out. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so the moment that she doesn't have to be careful, she stops being careful, mm-hmm. which is funny to me. You should treat yourself like glass until you are back to normal and yeah. then go ahead and throw yourself into it. <sighs> um, and we see some, you know, cool stuff in here as well. I just want to mention, right, there's that endless cloning. Uh, there's uh, Chevalier and his cannon blade, which is just super cool. Oh, yeah. Um, and then, of course, um, the the horrible, horrible moment when uh, that Kudzu clone touches noelle and suddenly there's four noelles yeah. which is just the most horrifying oh my god i was so worried about what was going to uh, happen after that it was it, it was real real bad yeah. <laughs> we're like okay we're, we're, we're barely holding our own against one and then and then fucking four. Oh, i had to like get up it's and just walk upsetting. around for a bit i was like what how are we going to fix this yeah so in in the process, both uh, Eidolon and Alexandria are are captured, mm-hmm. and um, basically the battle just pauses for a moment just to witness that. And uh, both a yeah a anti Alexandria and an anti Eidolon pop out. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, I actually wanted to to mention here um, that uh, all of the 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 clones actually have names. Uh, if you look at the chapter tags at the bro- at the bottom. Um, every single one is 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 named, I think. Uh, so I think uh, the Alexandria, the anti Alexandria, is Apocrypha, I believe, mm. and the anti Eidolon is Ignis Fatus, I think. Um, just mm. thought you might want to know. Do. Also, just like as a side note, that's like you know, like writing style and like the details, like while those mm-hmm. details of like of like filling in all of these, you know, pe- I don't know, just like. It's so wonderful to like see the the like thoroughness I think of like authorial um, world building, you know, because mm-hmm. like there's pieces that we don't see of of authors of authors like you know ways that you know, like they hold on to details I think, and it's just I just really like that about Wildbow and like Worm. It's just I like that. So what is like one specific example of what you're talking oh, about? Oh, well, the names, the names. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I thought you meant just like description oh, no, details. No, yeah, like yes. just like the details of how everything, like what everything is. Like there's there's pieces that that you know authors know about their characters that yeah, I mean they like mm-hmm. they don't tell anybody else, right? Because it's just like something that they hold yeah. on to. But like I don't know, I feel like there's we get pieces of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I think um, what, one moment that we didn't write down, but. Uh, so here, uh, Alexandria, or the anti-Alexandria Apocrypha, and uh, the anti-Eidolon basically give a give a speech to all the assembled heroes, mm-hmm. telling them about Cauldron, telling them that they've all been played for fools, and that some of them have bought their powers, and that the Case 53s were, were bought by Cal- yeah. Cauldron. So basically, all of the information's out of the bag. Yeah, it's quite a mess. Yes, yes. Which is not due... Uh, a lot of good for morale. No, uh, but it's it's okay because at this very last moment, basically, um, all does seem lost. There is potentially an indefinite amount of uh, Adelon and Alexandria clones mm-hmm. being popped out. Who knows? That uh, Taylor steps away, uh, talks to Clockblocker, and gets uh, Noel to charge her <clears throat> uh, before Clockblocker freezes the thread. And cuts Noel in half. Yes. And he doesn't know the plan beforehand in totality, right? Yeah. Because he's like, why didn't he get all mad about it later? But it's, she does this so often, like, because she did that, I mean, immediately right after, right? She does that to Sundancer, is that she... (laughs) Yeah. And when she's talking to Clockwalker, she she says that she doesn't know why she didn't tell him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, And it really is... It, yeah, it's it's a good question to ask. I think it's more, something that was not born out of logic in that moment. Yeah. Oh, actually, a thing that I wanted to mention before, uh, she's yeah, she's very much in favor of of not telling people things. When we were talking about blindness, one thing I I had forgotten to say say is that she's just so averse to like admitting weakness. Oh yeah, that absolutely. like I, I I mean, it would be pretty useful for the other heroes and stuff to know that she's blind, mm-hmm. right? But she doesn't tell them. Until she doesn't tell them ever. Yeah, I feel like if if Scapegoat hadn't said anything, she would not have. Yeah, shared yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it's 
it certainly wouldn't hurt for people that you're working with to know that you're blind. Yeah. yeah. But she, she has like such a very specific, she wants everyone to have a very specific image of her and concept, like, you know, like, um, uh, like perception of who she is and, and what she can do that she's yeah. so very like deliberate in the way that she presents herself. Also, before yeah. we get like way super far, I want to like point out in, in the midst of all this fighting, like she, she kind of like elects herself to mm-hmm. be doing like to be doing the kind of leadership type things right like yeah. she's the one who kind of like steps up and and you know s- just begins like she doesn't i and i feel like she does that in the midst of battle deliberately instead of mm. like kind of having this whole conversation about it cuz like with her bugs like when she gives these immediate sort of you know instructions people are like oh here's a bit of instruction and i can make this move but immediately yeah. like they're ceding you know kind of control almost over to her because she does that uh, like yeah. a very small amount uh, not really like very much at all but like with the leviathan where she just kind mm-hmm. of like inserts herself into like the narrative of things you know what i mean yeah. i mean like she's being helpful and everything but it's always like in the midst of battle like suddenly she, she's the one saying she didn't things, ask anyone yeah and everyone's she, listening she's totally outside the the command structure uh like if she'd asked hey miss militia can i lead on this she miss militia might say Yes, your power is useful. However, let me stand by you, and we'll mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. I'll I'll tell you what to how coordinate with people. Uh, but of of course, that wouldn't be quite as effective. But yeah, she ends up just making most of the most of the decisions where she can. Yeah, yeah, and it's and I feel like she, like the when she when it does be, when it becomes her ending up doing this, like the heroes just kind of like yield authority because it is like you know. It, in the middle of chaos, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's just very, it's very interesting how often she does that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, on making decisions for other people. So mm. after uh, Noel is cut in half, she manipulates Sundancer into killing uh, Noel and the people that are inside Noel. Although Sundancer doesn't know about it. Um, well, yeah, it manipulates Sundancer to killing people accidentally ag- again. Yeah. For like the third yeah. time, yeah, and and Sundancer brings it up previously. I feel like in a conversation. Yeah. I don't think it, it may be in this moment, but also maybe earlier where she's like, "I've killed people on accident." Yeah, and it's kind of like it, it, I mean, the people she's talking about are not the people that Taylor has made her kill. Oh, I don't okay. even know if Sundancer knows about those people. Yeah, see, like that's terrible. <sighs> yeah. yeah, I mean, Sveta feels awful about her body accidentally killing people. <laughs> How should Sundancer feel? Yeah. And I feel like it's just, it's just like yeah. such a, like a, uh, the epitome, I suppose you could say, or like a good example of, mm. of Skitter, like just kind of prioritizing using people for their like power or for their purpose, you know, and mm-hmm. not really thinking about the consequences, not thinking about the psychological consequences. Yeah. So after that moment, uh, that's when the travelers go home because Tattletail has created a dimensional portal. Um she wanted to do it to Earth uh, Aleph, which that door is kept open just long enough for uh, the the travelers to go home. Yes. Uh, but then she basically um, she, she she is able to get uh, at least for a labyrinth to turn the channel to an empty Earth without people mm-hmm. uh, as as a compromise with the with the heroes who are trying to avoid an interdimensional war. Yeah. Well, I I have a question about. Mm-hmm. Um, about the portal was was Tattletail like was her plan to send Noel through it or was there always a plan to I kill think... Noel and then send people send like the like how did how did her like tear in the dimensions fit into dealing with Noel like I I think one she wanted to send the travelers mm-hmm. home but also I think her idea was that she could potentially open a door to another dimension shove Noel through and then close it okay okay. I think that was another backup plan that, thankfully, was not necessary. Yeah, because yeah. then it's like you're sticking this poor Noel like upon unsuspecting people who don't have yeah. the power. Well, I mean, to... perhaps it could have been an empty Earth, just like what the if other they were one. Da- dinosaurs, you know, or tiny bugs. Who knows? <laughs> poor, tiny poor tiny bugs. bugs. Mm-hmm. They could be like bugs, like you know, full personality. <laughs> That's very. That is a possibility. You never know. There you know, they might have. You know, other. What if there's another Earth that has like that's like Narnia where it's like all the animals have like, you know, consciousness and they're able to communicate with each other in language. I like, think 
I think the possible Earths is is down is narrowed down to stuff that's physically possible or just like physically like has a has a percentage of of likeliness. And I don't. What, you never know. Feel you never know the evolutionary. You know, that plan. conscious animals. Fucking DNA is the weirdest shit, man. <laughs> like you never know. Yeah, we, we never know. <laughs> But okay, uh, so so uh, going back to an earlier point here, mm. um, uh, there's that the talk with uh, Tablet Hill uh, quote about flapping beings all part of a whole and um, oh, hypocritical yes. recklessness and and things oh, like that. Yes, yes. Oh, this whole conversation that I don't remember if it happens. I feel like it happens in the middle of a battle and they like step aside, but I don't. Yeah, they also talk about it after. Yeah, because yeah. they like come back in, and it's just mm. it's just I feel like Taylor is like being hypocritical in this moment because she's like all worried about Tattletail doing all these reckless things she, yeah, and she's, she's like, like lifting what, off on up, her fingers uh, and stuff. Tattletail, you're 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 saying all this this shit, you're getting people pissed off at you yeah, and, and stuff. Then, you're you're putting yourself in danger. And then like literally like two seconds, you know, ago or before, I don't know, she like is you know, she's talking to Noel and is like, Hey, like you can kill me, like it's fine. Like my team will be fine, you know, <laughs> take my sacrifice, blah blah blah. She has this whole plan, but like still she's like placing herself in harm's way also yeah. and she i don't know it's just i mean yeah T- tattletail's weapon is her words right that's, so that's if true. she's gonna be reckless it's gonna be reckless with her words yeah. Yeah. Mm. uh so arc 19 ends with two interludes which are quite fascinating so first we have the pair first um uh is the pair humans online message boards mm. right from uh greg's perspective of xx void cowboy xx yes. i think um so we we see a the multiple multiple things are happening here, right? We're getting through the course of this. We're we're getting Greg's per perspective and and you know facts about him and how he deals with stuff. But we're also getting mm-hmm. a lot of stuff about how the Echidna incident has disseminated through uh, the the world as an aftermath. We're getting um, flashes of just how Brockton Bay is is going and what the perception about Brockton Bay is, uh, who's been lost. Um, who is getting aid and just a very, very broad perspective of what's going on. Uh, slight note, um, the, uh, there's the, the part with, uh, wag the dog and, um, getting employed by the undersiders, which is just lovely. Um, oh, yes. I don't know if you, she, the one that really, really likes bitch thinks that she's super yeah. cool. Do we know who it is? Well, it's, I think it's just one of those people that ends up at, in oh. Rachel's yes. base later on. Oh, ah. Oh. It's very I, sweet. I I think it's the one that was making the the burgers. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, they, actually, you can actually if you if you pay attention to to usernames, you you see a couple things. That I didn't notice until this read through, but the person that replies to uh, wag the dog is Sierra. So I or maybe like Charlotte. Did, one of the I two. I feel like I know. I always get that them mixed one. up. Um, but other stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. It was interesting mm-hmm. too how they kind of like. I mean, we didn't fully under, like it wasn't like articulated in like an ordery sort of way, but like the way that they set up communication and authority in these groups, like in these online spaces and, and kind of yeah, how they, with badges and stuff. how the like material consequences of like receiving and delivering supplies and aid and all of this and kind of how they're kind of creating a digital presence um, that can kind of supplement the like material reality of, of what's going on in the aftermath, I think was really interesting, mm-hmm. especially when you kind of think about, um, post Shatterbirds kind of you know announcement. Um, I think it's really interesting. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I, I thought you would really like mm-hmm. this chapter just for the fact that it's a, a different medium. Yeah. basically. Oh, I love this chapter. I also loved it when we we got another glimpse of it when Charlotte was talking in her interlude. We get mm-hmm. a little bit again, but yeah, I liked it a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the the first reading where I truly hated mm-hmm. Greg. By the way. Uh, like I, I, I think hopefully on every single reading I disliked him, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and how he conducts himself here, but on this one I just like, man, he's just a total. I just hate the way he conducts himself online. It's just so gross. Yeah. Uh, um, but I mean that's I think he's not necessarily a, a a bad person, right? He does feel really bad when Taylor talks to him. Um, uh, it, and when after he's figured out um her secret mm-hmm. identity, um. Maybe I hate him so much because he's a lot how I was in high school, but... <laughs> ah, alas. Or the worst parts of how I was in high school, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's a bad dude Greg. online anyway. Greg is such a good name for him. Sorry to all the Gregs out yeah, there. but it is. 
It's only seventy dollars to change your name. Just saying. <laughs> Um, oh, the last little factoid before we go on. Um, G-String Girl, which is the the person that Greg is talking mm-hmm. to, is Feta. Yes, which is very interesting. And I kind of want mm-hmm. to go back and reread both of those just so I can, like, have a glimpse of them again. For sure. It, that, you know, she's talking about um, my parents are really strict. Mm-hmm. My sister's coming on. Um, so I, I have to give up the computer. Um, I, I can't send the picture and I don't want to explain why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think she's in, she's tagged at the bottom, I believe. So. Oh, man, I really need to, like, look at these tags. Apparently so. I, I've never done it except for the times where I've been told to. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. I think I just get wrapped up in the reading. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, following that, we have Emma's interlude, yes. which uh, is rather significant. It is. Um, so we see uh, her and her father being attacked by members of the ABB and rescued by Shadowstalker. It's this really extremely traumatic event. Uh, it really worries us as we're reading it actually but um in the aftermath she attaches herself to her savior and um her in in shadow stalker's ideology Mm -hmm. right of the binary of predator and prey and and stuff and she reshapes herself into someone into um that that sophia would approve someone who is strong in the aftermath she really her identity is kind of constructed as not taylor not victim taylor yeah um and and we see um how she bullied Taylor, among other things, uh, finishing off with her moving back to Brockton Bay and uh, seeing Taylor with her dad, who is now very different. And she uh, recalls her conversation with Sophia, the one that just happened and the one very long time ago. Um, on this brutish little planet of ours, it's the survivors who are the strongest yeah. or something like that anyway. Yeah. I don't know. It's that The, the conversation between them two, um, when she's, she goes to visit her in Juvie, I think is... Is, I don't know, it's just really sad, I think, because she has internalized the way that Sophia thinks so much that she is, like, very much ready to just kind of ditch her when she is when she doesn't fit the definition that she was. You know, that, like, mm-hmm. so often, like, she has, she has created her, like, for herself these expectations of how to act, how, how to conduct mm-hmm. herself, and she's, like, very, you know, we watch her kind of very deliberately cut out all those moments where she she could have made the choice that would take her away from this. You know, like we see those vestiges yeah. of her past self, right? Create outs in every single critical moment. And every time she chooses not to do that, she chooses the thing that's, that will continue to, you know, kind of keep her down the same path. Yeah. 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 We, I, yeah. Through, I, through all that, every time we see those like question moments where she reconsiders, we just see how incredibly fragile her construction of her defenses mm-hmm. are yeah she continually says to herself that she's gonna fake it until it's real but it never becomes yeah. real um except faking it also is real right all the terrible things she's doing is an actual it, she really is a bully yeah, right yeah, she's no. not faking it yeah yeah because like her conviction her conviction is so mixed you know because like her actions her actions dictate her mentality, but then also, like, her mentality doesn't fully reflect her actions. Or her actions don't fully reflect her mentality. Like, yeah. so she's kind of stuck in this sort of... She's stuck in a positive feedback loop. Aha! <laughs> yeah? So I, I don't know why I got so excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's just... I mean, it gives us more understanding of why she so very deliberately, like, cut out the like before right of being friends with taylor and everything and the after of it and so it doesn't seem quite as like out of left field instead instead of just like waking up in middle school and being like i don't want to be friends with this person anymore yeah um yeah but i don't know still is really rough though it's really sad kind of yeah all around both of them both both her and sophia's interludes i think were really difficult to kind of Mm -hmm. you know parse through i think yeah just because like both of them are so stuck in that mentality they've kind of created this very like very limited way that they can react Mm -hmm. yeah so uh with this chapter is very well placed because um the next arc is arc Mm -hmm. 20 chrysalis in which taylor goes to high school and is revealed as skitter so we begin with taylor at home with her father getting ready to go out and accomplish many things in the day um you wrote here fitting into her body very differently Uh, yes well okay so first like the first glimpse we see of her in this kind of like way that she's uh, like occupying herself um, or inhabiting herself. Right, she's I would very. Say. Um, we see it. Uh, Disney princess. 
Disney princess. Yeah, Disney princess because she's, you know, having breakfast or she's, uh, you know, brushing her teeth and stuff. Oh. And all her bugs are flying around <laughs> carrying her things for her. Oh, and I didn't generally just think being, about that. You know, like like she sings to the animals and they, they oh, do her chores for her. True. Yeah. No, I was just thinking about like mm-hmm. how she like, you know, inhabits her body. Like she's more like she's more like confident, I think, in herself. Because mm-hmm. she has things to do and, you know, like, you know, she's making plans and taking names or whatever the phraseology is. You know, she's, <laughs> she, she isn't, she isn't the person that she was in high school. You know, like she has, she yeah. has more control over herself and, and her self image, I think. Or like the things that she doesn't mm-hmm. examine are not like the, the top of the list isn't, isn't like thinking about, you know, how others, you know, physically perceive her. Like she's out there, like you know, kind of not thinking about murder and you know, et cetera, villainy. But like, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just like a very different way that she. It's she. She's in a very different place, I think. When when we have like we're resuming this oh, kind yeah. of like high school type, you know, encounter. She's just very different. Yeah, I mean, this this is definitely a reflection from that first chapter of arc two, mm-hmm. where, uh, yeah, they're <clears throat> having breakfast together. Yeah, I think it was just it became so stark to me, like in the moment. That we see her from Emma's perspective, where she's like, you know, helping her dad, doing box, like moving boxes, etc. And then now she's kind of like mm-hmm. getting things done. And we're, you know, we're like beginning the day and she has all this stuff. And she's like, I don't know, it's just very, it's very stark contrast, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he asks her about school and she tells him that she's not planning on going. And he disagrees with that, but he feels that he can't really do anything about it. And... Uh, he's lamenting that. She says that I'll let you have a say, and that actually just ends up hurting him more. Um, before they promise to meet up yeah, for lunch. That was that conversation was like, I mean, at one point, like she kind of, I mean, she's left home, right? She's like left home and like done her thing, and like she has a whole like you know other life, right? That she's doing, she's dealing with and managing. So like, it's understandable, but it, I don't know from his his perspective. I think like they don't have they don't he doesn't have authority anymore no matter how much mm-hmm. she says he does and like it's it, she doesn't even have to she doesn't even have to articulate what she articulates this i'll let you have a say in what i do in my life to that like that sentiment is already there you know right um which i feel like is what makes it so much worse because i mean the whole time like every time that we see him she has that you know conversation in her mind of like am i going to continue to let him be in my life like, am I going to continue, like, mm-hmm. this, am I going to, you know, sort of reconcile, not reconcile, have a have a sort of reconciliation, I suppose, in this relationship? Like, do I want to, con- to maintain what had been, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. She's the one choosing what to keep and what not to keep. Yeah. I think that was why I was so surprised that we began this arc with her at home. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we saw her in Emma's thing, but, like, she just, I, I guess I didn't expect her to, like go back and stay at home, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, where we left off, they were just starting to, just starting to um, interact. Yeah, yeah, Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, so... I'm sorry, I didn't read what I had written mm -hmm. down, but that's totally true. My thing that I wrote, I want to bring it up because it's important. Um, Because even (laughs) even in all of this, like, change and stark difference and all of this, you know, she's different and he's different and they have all this, like, baggage... um, the power dynamic of these two is is kind of it's almost not different than where we began. Yeah. Because she wasn't sharing yeah. details of her life with her in in that moment as well, you know. I mean, now it's like she's, you know, like ruling ruling the city instead of, you know, getting bullied, but like both both are sort of like driven by shame or like fear of how he's going to react or like how to deal with the new reality that she creates by giving him this information. Um so I suppose it, it while well, the the reasons be- behind their interaction are different. I think the way they interact is still sort of the same. Right. Yeah. 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 She still doesn't have super meaningful interactions, yeah. right, the, b- between the two of them, just because there's so much that she can't talk about. I, I mean, it's a step in the right direction, right? They're actually in physical contact, you know, <laughs> yeah, proximity. True, true. Yeah. Um, but as we, you know, especially as we see in Arc Twenty Two, he is very very estranged from yeah her. he doesn't but it's also it's been so long like it's it she hasn't for a while told him things you know yeah yeah 
Yeah. So she goes to deal with trouble in her territory. Um, there's some uh, thugs that stole from uh, this this Christian couple. The Christian couple asks her to be lenient to the attackers. Uh, so she tells them to go to the cops, and when they don't immediately go to the cops, she uh, stings them with bullet ants and then terrorizes them on their way. <sighs> and when the Christian couple's up- upset with that, she tells them that she was lenient. Oh, Skitter. She's just... And I feel I feel like this goes back to her old her whole deal where she's like she like likes to have things done her way, you know? Yeah. And so she like I mean she placates the people that she's helping, but like I don't know, she she, she has very specific things that she thinks need to happen. And specific ways to carry them out, I think, you know. Very true. If she doesn't budge yeah. she doesn't budge. Um She just like them. makes yeah. the demands into something that she wants to do. Yeah. Yes. So then Charlotte informs her that Greg um, has been making noise at Arcadia. He's been asking around for mm-hmm. her. And so now she has to deal with that because it has potential to blow up into something yes. bigger, which it ends up doing. Uh, when she gets there, there's a very notable divide between those who stayed and those who returned, quote, <laughs> as you wrote, all shiny and new. Um, she ends up finding Greg and basically manipulates him or gaslights him or just pretty... Uh, harshly rebukes yeah. him and makes him think that he was completely wrong and stalkery and yeah, yeah it was it's a it's a really like rough moment in in that where because she also has the moment like she has a thought that she feels like Emma in that moment doesn't mm-hmm. she I feel like I feel like I wrote that down not in here but like when I was yeah, reading yeah that I mean, I, she's she's I almost like note, taking um yeah where she like very clearly I mean like. I haven't brought it up yet, but like very, very much so throughout this whole book, she's paralleling herself against all, all these people that she has interacted with and mm-hmm. almost kind of gone like head to head. Most of the people that she does it are like, you know, her like enemies or whatever. Um, but I feel like in this moment, she kind of, she, she makes a note and, and I feel like that's why she feels bad is because in Greg, she sees her past self and like her mentality back then. And now she's kind of, yeah. She she is in a position of power, and while she feels bad about what she's doing, she which is interesting because like even unknowingly she becomes she she echoes Emma even more so because she has that she sees that uh-huh. yeah, what she's doing just like Emma sees what she's doing, but she still does it. Yeah, yeah. At, at the very least, uh, in this, she's not necessarily blaming that's Greg. True. Yeah, that's for true. being a victim. So but she is good. kind of mad that he like is disrupting oh, yeah, her for day sure. I she's mean, she like be doing i'm this just try- like i love the entire time anytime she inter- interacts with someone and they like fuck shit up or like mess things up or you know um delay her she's like i'm just trying to go to lunch yeah, yeah. you know it becomes kind of her like um theme or whatever for the arc but <laughs> it's very it's a i guess that's true but um just wanted to have lunch yeah, with her yeah. dad. just wanted to reconnect with my dad but oh, no i have to deal with all of this pulled her apart um I, I think also, um, in terms of like why she feels bad about Greg, is that uh, he isn't he isn't like an immediate like physical threat. You know, he's not a parahuman. He's not he's not somebody who is is like she's not having a fight. You know, she's not a, having a physical fight. She's not having to, you know, intimidate in order to prevent like physical altercation. You know, like she right. just kind of it, it's I don't know like it's a different sort of confrontation. Yeah. Yeah. So Taylor uh, then heads home, but she's not able to dodge Emma, who confronts her on the way out. Uh, Taylor is seemingly uncaring uh, to the pettiness of Emma's anger, but uh, Emma escalates. She says some pretty yeah, awful stuff. Uh, says that Taylor uh, is responsible for her mother's death, and at the very least, that her father uh, blames her for it. Um, but. Taylor's uh, I don't care attitude is so effective that Emma Emma eventually escalates to hitting her and then the system uh finally decides to punish her. Um she's they go to the principal's office and uh Taylor uh, pushes um the consequences on Emma and uh but then she finds out that this is all because the principal is corrupt. Yeah. And she very like I I don't know, she still holds that same sort of like you know, discontempt, or no, not discontempt, contempt for for the fact that mm-hmm. the system is still corrupt. Even if it is beneficial to her, she's still kind of like, well, that's dumb. Like, it should work because, you know, we're seeking justice, not yeah. because 
of any sort of like particular biases. Um, right. Also, as a total side note, but is very related. Um, she like uh, Taylor thinks through and like reflects upon. She takes like a second to sit there and like think through the fact that her father like blames her for her mother's death. Mm-hmm. Like she like very like like coldly like systematically like thinks like like pinpoints all these moments that could like corroborate that. Yeah. Which is like a a really you know kind of jarring thing I think to happen in the middle of this fight. But then yeah, she. I mean yeah, Emma does that yeah. hits home. But then she like still remains. I mean to us she seemingly remains calm and collected and cool and cold and all of this very calculated. You know all of those like exact precise c words but um i don't know she the way that she's presenting the narrative i think is not what actually is occurring yeah it's it's I think. interesting because over and over and over again she says i don't care I, you know what I, I i'm even surprised that i don't care right but i think she does i mean she sticks around the conversation she takes delight in having some good comebacks and getting a reaction out of emma uh she she is getting really pissed off right really really pissed off right it's showing off in her bugs Mm -hmm. and she chooses to stay so that emma receives consequences she and then later on she scares emma with a centipede right i don't think that means that she doesn't care Yeah, like Like, the the indifference that i think Moving beyond this would entail would just be to walk away, you know. Like she still yeah, holds just on to that dodge like, around her or something. That kind of desire to like see this to the end of it, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know, but it's also that said, this confrontation is is viscerally satisfying to someone um, rooting for Taylor. That's very true. Yeah, and rooting for the downfall of Emma. Yeah, we've kind of like been waiting since the beginning for this mm-hmm. to occur. And so yeah. we're kind of like, ah, you know, like now that she's in this place. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I was thinking, looking at this versus like um, how she reacts to Sophia, like learning about Sophia and, as as Shadow Sucker. And then like, you know, um, when they go and seek her out and, you know, like have have Regent, have like the Undersiders go and seek Shadow Sucker out and put her under Regent's control. In this confrontation, she doesn't have the same sort of like visceral, you know, you know, kind of uh, satisfaction, I guess, of, I mean, there is satisfaction, there is this kind of like, you know, revenge sort of feel, but like, it's not as, it's, she's not as connected to her emotions, I think, as like, Mm -hmm. after the Leviathan, um, after, you know, the whole hospital scene, and then they go, like the Undersiders get, get Shadow Soccer and like that whole conversation and that whole you know, like section, I would say, um, of interactions between those two. Um, those are much more like charged, I think, because her her emotions mm-hmm. are so much closer to the surface in in that earlier interaction than yeah. what's happening right now with Emma. Because, like, I think to her, she mm-hmm. feels cold and disconnected and sort of indifferent because she has like she. I mean, you know, at this point, she's kind of been not processing her emotions for like a while. You know what I mean? Like she kind of she and she has yeah. been practicing that that compartmentalization to an extreme that I think even in the moment that she's feeling like that resentment and anger in the fight and like ready that, you know, kind of readiness to exact revenge, all of this, I think that, that you know, is manifested in the bugs and that sort of thing. I think because she she is so like kind of disjointed almost in her in her like emotional life. I think I think that's why she kind yeah. of depicts it as being cold. Yeah. Yeah. That she just is really good at not paying attention mm-hmm. to them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so after uh, the confrontation with Emma, uh, basically she's uh, the the school goes on lockdown as she has just been uh, found out that she is Skitter, right? Taylor and Skitter mm-hmm. are the same person. She's eventually chased to the uh, cafeteria where. Uh, dragon and defiant show up and, and confront her uh, so they they reveal her civilian identity um, under duress and in front of the entire school emma has just found out that taylor is skitter the ruler of brockton mm. bay uh, and they have this long drawn out uh, conversation where uh, she's trying to ask them why they decided to do this why are they doing it here yeah and uh this conversation is is really really deep. It's it's kind of hard to cover every single thing in it, but um, 
Yeah, a lot happens here. A lot does happen, but I feel like something very notable、um, that occurs in in the moment that she is, you know, kind of revealed to be、um, Skitter is that her first like thought in how to deal with this situation is she's like, who 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 walks around unmasked,、um, but still is able to kind of conduct himself in a manner of authority, right? And she's like Jack Slash. And so she pulls on his like image and confidence and the way that he embodies space or like、uh, inhabits space. Actually, not inhabits. He would be one that occupies space, right?、Um, and she kind of like prepares herself by putting on, kind of emulating him. You know what I mean?、Mm-hmm. And it's a very like strangely conscious decision. I don't yeah. Know, it's, it's I don't know her. All of, all of the parallels are so fascinating to me, but this particular one especially because she like. Immediately assesses the situation and sets it up, like physically sets up the setting so that she has both control, but also seems like she does not have control. You know?、Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She she repeatedly puts herself in the most vulnerable、yeah. position because she knows that she's already in a vulnerable、mm-hmm. position, so it doesn't really. She's not sacrificing that much, but she is able to portray herself in 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 a different way because of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, she actually gains an advantage by appearing more vulnerable. Yeah. Also, it's sorry. I, th- this is this is like only like、mm-hmm. a small bit of this because there's like so much to talk about in this particular scene.、Um, but the fact that like Clock Blocker, who has not seen her face, only、mm-hmm. recognizes her, but has spoken. Yeah, to he's her. spoken to her, and he only recognizes her when she grins. Is just like so interesting. Yeah.、Um, which I don't know, like. I just that's so interesting to me. I because she she commands attention in such an interesting. I don't know. I I don't I don't have words for it. But I want to see this scene so、yeah. badly in, in a visual and auditory format.、Uh, yeah, and, and it's such a such a climactic moment,、mm-hmm. right? Where、uh, we, we just came off of a you know a very violent arc, but we're we're getting back into it. But we just came off of the super emotional high,、uh, first、uh, escalating with Greg, and then. Going sky high with Emma, yeah,、uh, and then we're in just this mess of of feelings, knowing that Dragon doesn't want to do this, knowing that Dinah recommended it, knowing that to her identity has been revealed,、um, and, and all the consequences around that, and yeah, it's just this. And she's like, she doesn't、turmoil. react to it in the way like she she intentionally yeah, doesn't react to it with just, Dinah, yeah, all of it like. This whole this whole sequence where she just kind of like decides, well, this is how it's going to be now,、um, is which to me seems like very overwhelming, but to her she's just kind of like,、yeah. this is another one of those things where she's just kind of like placed it in a box and is like, okay,、mm-hmm. now we're gonna keep moving forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah.、Uh, so she she gives her her speech and、um, at the end her. Underside of renown and the tales of I'm, I'm reading from your uh, uh,、yes. writing here.、Um, tales of the teens in the city combine into a whole crowdsourced escape plan.、Uh, parentheses very area fifty one comma we're all sick because we're gay comma bugs life comma strike <laughs> sort of way. End parentheses. She gets out because some some of the students stand with her against dragon and defiant.、Uh, the last vestige of Taylor is gone now. And her father knows.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting.、Um, yeah, do you do you want to real quick、uh, explain the, all the things all in the my... parentheses? Okay. I, I, the only one I recognize is Bugs Life, and I don't know what you're calling out about Bugs Life. With the with the like crickets, or you know, or the grasshoppers, you、uh-huh. know, they're like yeah, yeah. The whole scene where the guy he's like explaining about you know we got to make sure that they don't. All gather up together because then they will beat us, and then they do. They all gather up together, all the ants, and they beat the grasshoppers, you know, because they all like work together, you know, crowdsource. And then like it's been a very long time since I watched、oh. Bugs Life, but I'll take your word for it. I don't. I I, I don't. I don't <laughs> think I've seen it. Oh, maybe I did see it recently. I don't know. It's like this whole mentality of like striking, you know, like、mm-hmm, yeah, you yeah. know,、uh, you you never cross a picket line, sort of thing, where it's like everybody's working together. Right. And then, like the Area Fifty One, you know that whole, you know that ha- that was a few months ago, right? Where everyone was like, "Let's make a plan to go." Oh, to Area so you're talking about like real life Area Fifty One, not yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think that was last year. Last year, who knows? Time is irrelevant. Yeah. And also unbound. Yes. yes. <sighs> and then,、uh, um, and then, yeah. I don't remember which、uh, 
European nation it was, but there was some European nation that made it like they they made it legally. Oh yeah, it's a Norwegian country where being gay was, was like a, a like a medical uh, condition, actual like, or a, like a, yeah, a mental yeah, illness. Yeah. And so people and were so like calling in sick, saying that yeah. they're gay, um, which I feel like happened in the seventies in my head, but Sounds I don't remember. About right. Anyway, so all of it was, you know, know, like everyone uh, working together to get something done. Yes. Everyone yeah. working together, right? Um what I what I find really interesting here is that it's not just like a a portion, right? There's there's a there's a part there where uh, Taylor basically uh, um calls it out of like she d- didn't know what she was, would expect she like a a slow rising or just like a couple people or mm-hmm. all at once. Mm-hmm. And then it's like two thirds of the people yeah. there, right? Or, so it's basically every single person that stayed in Brockton Bay stands up on yeah. on her side. Yeah, and and yeah, well, it's it's important to note because like the the mentality of people like this is this is like the first ish day, right? This is the first day of of returning to high school, right? So they've been like, yeah, they've been living this life, you know, dealing with you know the PRT, dealing with the local warlords, and like dealing. With all of these things that have been happening to the city, without the guarantee, like without the the knowledge and control that comes, or not really control, but like the the like you know knowledge of being one of the people that is making things happen, they're just kind of watching it happen, right? And they mm-hmm. haven't really had control over what their situation is, right? And this, I feel like, offers yeah. a a modicum of control over their their bodies and and lives. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, they're finally able to do some. This is one of the few places in the, I mean, really the entire story where the like the common, the non-parahumans actually are able to like make yeah. a choice yeah. in something that affects parahumans. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just, I really liked this scene. Um, but then yeah, oh, well, it's wonderful. Additionally, I think it is important to note that this again, we're returning to Skitter using the guarantee of non-lethality against mm-hmm. dragon yeah it's like the third time or something defiant because yeah. like the way that dragon and skitter seem to interact there's a lot of that right where where skitter's like manipulating dragon in that sense of like using the non-lethality you know policies i, I think it's actually i think it's the third time she uses uh like the reputation of heroes against defiant and the yeah, third she, time every that time she that uses they interact, it's not always a killing crowd. people against dragon mm-hmm. Because, because just just to run through it, so um, Armin's master, right? There's a part at the uh, the 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 dinner, yeah, the, right? The, the fancy dinner that they crashed. Then there's the hospital, mm-hmm. and then there's here. Mm-hmm. And then with Dragon, there is uh, when they raided the uh, wards HQ, and then when they took down the uh, when she took down the Azazel, yeah. and then here as well. So two two three beats going down here uh, with the Taylor just being very manipulative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's also it's fascinating yeah. too because both of those two are like their whole like one of their things is to analyze the way that like that people fight, right? But then they fall mm-hmm. into the same patterns with her over and over again. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. really interesting. I'm I'm very possibly because fasc- it's not that's fighting. Very true. That's very true. Um, yeah. I'm excited to see how they interact, all three of them. Oh yeah, because we we finish with a interaction with them yeah. in Arc Twenty Two uh, at the end. Yeah. Um, so th- this this section here ends with uh, all those teens, right? The 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 few ones that are walk with her um, out, the the ones that are left, they basically tell her all the mm-hmm. reasons that that they stuck with her. All those people that she's helped, but refused to let herself feel like she's helped. And it's this really emotional moment, and I, I get emotional reading it too. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. As they as they tell her why they're thankful and why they decided to to stand up for her. Yeah, yeah. I really liked this this arc a lot, and especially this moment. I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So after arc twenty, we have uh, the reporter interlude mm-hmm. from Stan's perspective. Also, I want to point out that um, the interludes of the audiobook are so so good so good this is another one of the excellent ones i don't did you did you listen to the yamato one i no i kind of need to i well when i get reading okay. the yamato one like the can't. uh Stop. the the parahumans online one 
this interlude, uh, the the reporter interlude, those three in particular, and I'm sure there's others, that, but the, these are the ones that stand out in my mind, are just just brilliant. Yeah. They're just so, so well done. They, like, um, th- this one in particular, whenever they uh, go from, um, like, one scene and then it, like, it shifts into, like, a TV in another scene, mm-hmm. right? Like, you can hear, like, static start coming uh, in and it sounds more like it's on TV. Yeah. It's just very well done. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, Stan goes and looks into the school affair. He talks a little bit about Guan Xi, the uh, practice of uh, being able to call someone up for a favor after many years. Um, talks to students, oh, yeah. including Greg, uh, and centers the story around the student support of Taylor. Uh, the implications of uh, her leading the city and the PRT's ineffectiveness as it, quote, is like collapsing or disintegrating. Like, that, that kind of language is used over and over. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so then we see the perspectives of, of many people, um, many different, it, basically everyone that would, would care about mm-hmm. this, right? Uh, Danny um, walks, watches in shock and dismay. Shadow Soccer freaks out after learning about yeah, Taylor Skitter she, and she, Juvie. She, like, knocks out the um, TV. The, doesn't she? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Rather aggressive move. Uh, the PRT is very worried about what's going to happen. Um, you wrote uh, with, with uh, what are, with Intel groups? Oh, international you, groups. International groups who are like, hmm, that's what you wrote. Yeah. Um, and then finally we end this chapter with uh, a perspective from the Nine as they prepare to make many, many, many oh, copies of themselves. no. Oh, I'm so worried about them. But also, I'm so excited, because that means they're definitely coming back. Mm-hmm. Ah, I shouldn't be so happy about that. that. Like, it'll be a mess, I know. But they're just such fun in, like, a twist, you know? Mm-hmm. I, anyways, we don't need to dwell upon that. Ah, but the, yeah, I'm, yeah, we'll talk about that when that mm-hmm. happens. Yes. Um, oh, but I wanted to mention especially, like, a lot of the, like, media-related bits... Of like this interlude and like, cause we, we follow, you know, Stan the reporters, you know, kind of his story throughout everyone else watching it. Right. And, and then like mm-hmm. with the parahuman on, parahumans online, you know, message boards and Charlotte, like, I really like where we get kind of a glimpse of everybody. Um, just like in, in terms of like writing style or device, I don't know. I don't know if it's a style or device of like, like kind of following the thread as it kind of like, you know, as a watersheds that those are two metaphors that don't fit together but um <laughs> i don't know i think it it works really effectively for us to kind of like get a sense of what's going on on the outside um mm-hmm. yeah. yeah 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 kind of like fills out the sort of like kaleidoscope sort of thing mm-hmm. yeah i i think this this chapter is just very effective at showing us everything that's that's mm-hmm. relevant to this basically yeah so we get a, a second interlude then from accord uh who you've written, the man whose immediate problem-solving skills involve a lot of killing, but long-term plans are for fucking ending world hunger and solving all the world, world's emergencies. Uh, he comes to the Brockton Bay because of the portal um, and has to put up with the undersiders to gain access. He's in cahoots with Cauldron and needed Coil to do something, and um, now is working with the undersiders. Yeah, well, it seems like he sort of like transferred his expectations and Cauldron's expectations of mm-hmm. Coil onto the undersiders. Um, mm-hmm. Also... He's just, I really love him a lot. He's I know, that's so great. That's so great. Ah, I'm getting so excited about it, but I need to calm down if I'm going to explain everything. <laughs> but yeah, he's just, he's so fascinating, especially because like he makes all these like really like, like, like he's bound books and sent them off, you know? Mm-hmm. And like, he, I don't know, it's just, he's both like very aware of how everything is working but then also like i mean he's not naive about it but like he has that sort of like 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 optimism in his books mm-hmm. that he has made that solve all the problems yeah. and uh, but at the same time he's like really kind of stuck in the way that he's thinking like it, it you know it's it, i don't know uh, uh, yeah <laughs> sorry i just i really yes. like him yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's yeah. He's one of my my favorite characters to read about. He's just so interesting, and I want to see what his plan is for ending. World I know. Hunger. I want to read these books. Among that he has the things. Made. Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah. And he has this. He has this. He has a mental illness that just makes it very, very, very difficult not to be a murderous mastermind. Yeah. Like I almost don't blame him for murdering people. Yeah. No. Like if, uh, if there's so many like his intrusive thoughts are like 
like physical and visceral and so intense. Yeah, very yeah, sensory. Yeah. Mm. And also, there's two things. There's two things that I really liked in this particular interlude that kind of have to do with a core, but like aren't. They're like um, when when Taylor was when Skitter was explaining right in their like meeting, um, she like made this list, this kind of hierarchy of like who would kill him for retaliation. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't think actually it wasn't him. It was somebody else, wasn't it? Was it? No, it was him. It was him. Um, where she kind of like makes this list of like how painful his death will be based on who's going to kill him. <sighs> and it was just very visceral. I must, I, I'm going to read it out. If that's all right. Um, Go ahead. If you're lucky, imp slits your throat with you none the wiser, or regent has one of your underlings stab you in the back and you go quick. If you're unlucky, Bitch's dogs tear you to shreds, and it's a long, drawn-out, painful process. If you're very unlucky, you get the worst of both worlds, and you deal with me. Which is just, whew, what a, what a like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's just so funny that she's, like, made this list. Yes. Yes. I wonder if she prepared yeah, that. I don't know. I mean, at this point, right, this is, like, immediately after she's been kind of, like, she's decided to be fully skitter and, you know, supervillain. She's embraced all yeah. of her villainy. Also, the the school thing I think was earlier in the yeah. day or like yesterday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. so she's like still kind of like she hasn't processed it yet. She's just kind of right. she's made her like you know decision where she's just gonna toss out those those inhibitions that she had and she has plans you know that she's not telling anybody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah. And then another we were talking about words like a while ago about words that we like. Mm-hmm. Um. And I was thinking, you know, I, I wrote small potatoes, you know, because it was just the, you know, phraseology of it. But uh, his, the, his description of, of um, Citrine's, like, face as, like, a décolletage. Is that how you pronounce it? I do not know, uh-huh. but I like it. This uh-huh. phrase, this particular word. very, I like it a lot. Yes. Okay. Do, do you have, like, the definition of it? I th- well, I think it's just her face that I... I think Does it, it mean more? I thought it was, like, the, the stuff that's on her face. But maybe I'm wrong. It's yeah. The, the décolletage is the huh, a low neckline on a woman's dress or top. Wonderful. See, <laughs> words are just great. I knew I liked it. <laughs> it is a pretty good word. Thank you, French people. Yes. Uh, okay, so then we have uh, Arc Twenty One Imago mm-hmm. or Imago. I don't know how that's pronounced. Wherein the skitter makes plans and visits everybody just to you know check in. Uh, so she's very aggressive in this meeting with Accord and the Fallen and the Teeth, uh, laying out the reality of what's going to happen. Then the Undersiders have a chat about it afterwards, um, considering their options, this new post-Taylor uh, identity situation, and uh, confront Parian about not being fully bought into the Undersiders. Yeah, people, it's, it's, um, it seems like the, she's kind of like a pulling, she's pulling the kind of a Regent Tattletail Imp sort of thing, where like, they all decided together that they were going to like um that they were going to use shatterbird or like i don't remember wh- the particular moment where they were talking i don't know the one the moment where she like she gets all mad that they didn't tell her but it wasn't about the morality mm-hmm. i feel like that's what happens here is that like she didn't tell them that she was going to be super aggressive and they were kind of mad about that part mm-hmm. of it and like having to yeah. deal with that bit but they weren't i feel like they would not have been as mad if she had explained her reasoning but then right. to explain her reasoning she would have to like talk about everything and She's not, she, yeah, she's, she, hates she's, that. she doesn't need to explain to other people. She just needs to expect them to understand. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's Taylor. But the, the thing that was particularly notable about this conversation uh, with Parian is that the way that Tattletail speaks to her is very much how, like her interaction is very much like Taylor in like the way beginning, you know, where, yeah, where Tattletail is kind of like, we need to kind of, you know, um, uh, subsume you I don't know, like take you in i suppose like you know the like like a mitochondria you know like take take them into this like group right and she needs to like fit in uh-huh um but she hasn't like opened up emotionally and like vulnerably right, and right. she's kind of like not very violent which seems to be kind of yeah. a prerequisite for this group um yeah <laughs> but i feel like it's very notable that it's tattletail doing this you know because she kind mm-hmm. of she has been the glue of the group i think you know, like she, mm-hmm. she recognizes those emotional bonds immediately. And like, she knows how she like, yeah. cause Taylor, I don't think if, if she didn't have, if she didn't work really hard at making sure to do those things, I don't think she would, you know, cause she's yeah. the one who was like, 
Taylor, we're going to be friends, you know? And then she's like, you should go yeah. hang out with Brian. Yeah, Lisa's not, like, the heart, but maybe she's, like, the vascular yeah, system yeah. or the nervous system. Just a network of mm-hmm. connections and, like, holding on to people. Yeah, yeah. She, like, she sets things in motion so that they are closer, you know? Yeah. 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 And so with Taylor becoming increasingly aggressive, you also see Tattletale uh, get increasingly concerned Mm -hmm. as things go, but never actually putting down a foot and saying, Taylor, seriously, stop. Yeah, it is very interesting. She says that she's concerned, but there's never any. Yeah. Which does that is that do you think it's because she doesn't feel like she has that sort of authority over Taylor at this point? Or is it because she feels like she knows that there maybe is going to be something that is going to happen and she can't affect it i don't know i I feel like she could try a little harder i I think she just really doesn't want to hurt taylor's feelings she she never wants to hurt taylor's feelings well it's the whole thing of like she feels she wants to like make sure that she doesn't have a repeat of like her brother yeah right yeah. So uh, Tattletail, Rachel, and Skitter go attack the PRT headquarters where they confront Tag. Uh, he basically describes how he's uh, he's not a winner. Mm-hmm. He's a scrapper. He's going to keep fighting. Uh, even if he's losing, uh, he's going to sacrifice everything just to give his enemy a bloody, a bloody nose. And um, that's his uh, justification for revealing mm-hmm. her identity because this isn't a game, little girl. This is a war. Um so he doesn't play by the rules, even though he holds the same things untouchable for the other side. And um, Taylor, j- just to prove some kind of point, at least mm-hmm. for herself, she uh, pretends to attack his wife, but then doesn't. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't really do anything to him because he knows that she's a full-fledged villain yeah. either yeah. way. He's like already decided who she is. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this whole conversation is really, I don't know, like, and Tag does a lot of, like, psychological, you know, um, attrition, I would say, um, in his, yeah. in his, you know, kind of attack upon her is that he does a lot of, of defining her in ways that she would not define herself, right? So he, like, calls her a little girl and he belittles her and all this, like, later on he calls her, he's like, you're not... You're not somebody's kid. You're not like, I don't care about that. You're a thug, this sort of thing where it's like, yeah, he has, he has made her into something that is only like a piece of her, I think. So, you know, like, mm-hmm. so that his, his, you know, understanding of her can, he has limited himself to understanding her in, in that like smaller capacity, which yeah, I don't know. I feel like that's a mental, that's like a technique of people who are in war or whatever. I don't know. But yeah. 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 And then I feel like the sparing of his wife is is her her way almost of kind of like replaying and like reliving that the whole like interaction she has with the mayor and how she kind of like fucks that part up where she like mm-hmm. almost kills Triumph and all of that. I feel like this is that in this moment after she has decided to become a fully fledged villain that she's kind of told herself that she will be um you know that she's going to do all this she's going to be that very aggressive she like she's going to do all these things she she has set up a test for herself to make sure that she still has the capacity to hold back you know yeah 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 it, it's more mm-hmm. for herself than anyone else and tattletale says 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 as much yeah. yeah um yeah so how do you feel about tag in particular um, he's interesting because he comes off as a total asshole, yeah. right? And especially from Taylor's perspective, it's really hard not to have that feeling about him. But also, he's not entirely wrong. Um, like, she, they did take yeah, over a city, yeah. and, like, what, what is someone's identity to taking over a city, right? Yeah, it's very true. Um, and, it, I mean, eventually he's, we, you know, we find out that he's mostly wrong because he talks to Dinah, and Dinah, as a precog, is almost certainly right that, you know, uh, just taking Taylor in in the most direct way is not doesn't actually improve mm-hmm. the numbers, right? But like, yeah, he he is fighting to remove warlords from a, an American city. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's the status quo, but like, it's not that unreasonable to to be fighting pretty yeah, hard like, against. I mean, he's it. bringing in expectations of 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 like uh, some something that is beyond him. You know, like I mean, he's kind of made it like the way that he's talking. He makes it seem like it's personal, but it's not. 
you know, mm-hmm. and she takes it as personal, but then he's really just like a, a physical embodiment of like a whole group of people, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, like a, he, he is, he is the representative, right? Of all these people. Yeah. Um, so I feel like while his methods, I don't think are great. I think that's what, but like his, his, uh, motivations, I think are understandable. Yeah. Yeah. So afterwards, uh, Taylor runs off, uh, on, on a dog, um, after her encounter with Tag and all the things mm-hmm. he said to her and Tattletail's assessment that it kind of yeah, did get yeah. to her. Uh, she goes to her mother's grave, um, and basically decides to just, uh, just talk to her mom, right? Uh, eventually, um, a, a groundskeeper comes by and s- sees her in a costume, um, but decides to just give her... She, she has her paper and tea, and uh, he gives it to her, and she writes 12 pages yeah. um, for her father, leaving it there. He's so nice, this groundskeeper. Yeah, he's he's a cool guy. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's interesting, too, that, like, she keeps running specifically, like, from the PRT, right? Like, and this is the second time that she has run to, like, a parental figure for, like, comfort and reassurance, and more so in this moment, catharsis. Because, um, like, mm-hmm. before, didn't she showed up at her dad's place. I think, yes. Right. You know, and then, and I feel like in this moment, it's the first that we really see of almost this entire book, you know, the set of arcs that she has taken a moment to, I mean, I guess we sort of see it um, when she's having a, that chat with clock blocker in, in Mm -hmm. when she's like a hostage, but like, it's not, there's never a moment where she sits down and thinks to herself about what she has done, you know? And like the mm. ramifications of it and, and how she feels about it. Like she's definitely like, she's always evaluating the, the material consequences of things that she's doing, but she hasn't had the moment where she just kind of processes everything that she has done, you know, like herself mm. and her actions yeah. and like her reactions to things that, you know, that she just kind of files away in the moment and all of this. And I think this particular instance, I think gave her that space to do so. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting like at the in the cafeteria, right? She recounts all of those things mm-hmm. that she's done, right? She talks about carving out eyes and chopping off toes and and everything, but she also just presents it like completely devoid of of mm-hmm. context um that she has used to justify things herself. And there there's other times too, uh like during the Echidna fight, there's a clone basically kind of saying the same thing, yeah. right? And it, like she lets herself she justifies things in the moment and then afterwards just like picks the worst thing about it and like the, the you know the the worst sounding thing about it and kind of uses it to yeah, beat herself yeah. up but she doesn't it yeah it's this weird just layering of feeling bad about something but not thinking about it but also bringing it up but also not you know actually mm-hmm. going through it in her own head so it's interesting yeah yeah she she really like picks and chooses when because like she never it's always like she uses it as a barbed attack upon herself you know she doesn't there's never where she like kind of you know unpacks all of this like broken glass and like sorts through it you know what i mean yeah 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 so uh afterwards um she goes with uh is there anything else to mention here by the way no right oh at the no yeah yeah that's good Okay, just checking. So then she goes with uh, with Regent and Imp to take out the Fallen. Um, she's there to basically check out how they operate. Um, so um, they pretty handily take out they the do. the Fallen, the the Fallen, and and subdue Haven pretty easily. Uh, and uh, she, I mean, she she drops um, Elagos from like a two story drop onto all fours, yeah. which is like. That's Ow. terrible. And then Valafor, she puts maggots into his eyeballs. Uh, which, I mean, at the like, it um, is kind of like that is the that is a good solution to kind of incapacitating him. But I feel like it returns yeah, to the concept uh, just, of just just to make sure. Um, when the first times I read it, I understood that if she put maggots like under his eyelids, that's not no. what happened. They're, They're like in inside his of his yeah. eyeball, inside of it. Oh my god. <sighs> So great. So great. Horrible. So uh, Regent and Imp, Imp are also having this mm-hmm. developing dynamic. Um, she uh, has let him control her, although to be fair to them, she does have a really good argument that like as soon as he goes to sleep, she's freed yeah. no matter what. So, you know, 
kind of that that is a pretty safe thing. Um, I mean, um, but um, guess, but like, I don't know that. What if he just doesn't go to sleep? But he has to sleep eventually. That's true. I guess I don't know. <laughs> so so I'm so the point is is that there there he could inflict one very horrible, no good, very bad day. But afterwards, you would probably, I mean, not guaranteed, but probably be able to, you know, That's destroy true. him. That's true. So, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Um, Just, it seems, I, well, I feel two ways about this, right? Because, mm-hmm. like, their dynamic is seemingly good. Like, they're, they're, like, they have a relative balance of power that, like, yeah. the rest of the Undersiders... Like, like, they are a little bit off to the side versus the rest of the Undersiders, and they kind of, like, have formed this, like, friendship relationship type thing. But it's also, like, I don't know, like, Regent is still, like, Regent, you know? And then Imp yeah. just, like, goes rogue a lot. Like, she just does things, <laughs> you know, just because she can, and, and I feel like there's a recklessness to both of them that I Probably, feel like could yeah. be dangerous, you know? Yeah. But then... Yeah. Also, they both need companionship, you know, they need, which I feel mm-hmm. like is good because they have given that to each other. I don't know. I go back and forth about this. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but Taylor's purpose here basically is to kind of see where they're going and then set them on a path that isn't so yeah. horrible. Um, she's worried about the kind of people that they'll be in the future and she wants them to be powerful, but not mm-hmm. bad, basically. Or not horribly yeah. bad anyway. Just, you know, a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um oh go ahead well we don't have to add the bit about a court but i just thought it was great because i mean like they had like a meeting and such and let let me let me just open up that scene so uh the next scene basically taylor meets up with uh brian and uh Mm. citrine to uh, negotiate for a second um one thing that is uh, in in the in the negotiation she accepts or she offers that uh um, they'll look at uh, Accord's plan for the city. Mm-hmm. Which I feel like, of all the people that look at his plans, I feel like she would be one that would actually consider it, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tattletale, though, I think would just... Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know not. about Tattletale. It, it, just the, the, after reading it from Accord's perspective and hearing, oh, Tattletale might get a kick out of debating the finer points of the plan, and it's like... It's a cord's power. His power is to make plans. Yeah. Don't debate the plan. It's his. <sighs> it's just he, he. When it comes to his plan, he knows yeah, more than you. Just, That's he's his so very power. Thorough about I just it. like. I mean, it's this whole thing, and it's uh, size eight font, and it's just. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can just imagine him sitting there typing away, and it's just. I love it. I love it so much. <sighs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so, uh, so afterwards, uh, Brian and, and Taylor talk about their relationship. She pushes him towards therapy oh. so that he could... Wait, sorry, oh, I just ahead. had a moment that I... There was, there was somebody that mm-hmm. Accord reminds me of, um, and it's Cassandra. Uh-huh. Um, from? From the Greek play that, I don't know which one, uh-huh. but it has, like, Lacoon in it, yes. you know, and his sons and all of this, and she's, like, she comes out of the city, I don't know, and she, like, her, her mom... Has like another kid, but then she like kills her kid and marries some other guy, and he kills his kid. Uh, anyways, <laughs> that that part's irrelevant. So, yeah. So but, what is like, the connection? Cassandra to, to is the one a, a that tells she tells the future, but nobody listens to her, right? So she knew that her uh, her brother yeah. was going to die, yeah. and her mom was just like, whatever, like you don't know anything. And then you know yeah. the kid, and, like her her brother obviously dies, and then everyone blames her because like she knew it was going to happen, and no one did anything because like yeah. the gods made it so that no one would listen. And I feel like that's a chord. I feel like a chord is like I have yeah. this plan. I know how to stop things, and everyone's like, "What are you fucking talking about? Yeah. We have our thing. Like we don't need to hear from you." Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. I think that's accord. Mm. Yes. Hey, um, sorry. Continue. So, continue. So back to Taylor and Brian. So so they talk. Uh, she pushes them to have therapy. Um, basically so that he can take over for leader quote unquote in case something mm-hmm. happens um so and then he asked her what are we you know talking asking basically can you see us you know having children getting married that kind of thing and she can actually but she doesn't answer in time so he says yeah thought so yeah. which is just like god damn it but in any case they both 
basically agree to break up amicably, that it was something nice. And they uh, sleep together one final time before uh, in the morning she cleans it up with bugs, but we'll skim over that. <laughs> um, it's all very, it's a very reasonable um, breakup. Yeah, it's very, like, very, you know, logical, which I feel like has been their whole thing. You know, it's very... Yeah. They got together because it made yeah. sense, yeah. basically. Huh. Also, I just love his, like, wondering of, like, what are we, you know? And then he, he, like, goes down this path and it, like, escalates one after the other where he's like, children? Marriage? Monarchy? Great. <laughs> I mean, he didn't say monarchy. He was, like, the king and queen or whatever of all of this. But it was very funny. Um, yes. But I feel like uh, their relationship sort of, like, in this arc, it kind of... It, she she's taking care of him but like as she it's as the leader of the undersiders you know more so than his like mm -hmm. like girlfriend or like you know partner or significant other yeah. like it 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 wasn't it wasn't as much of like us two against the world or whatever you know like there's there's other relationships in in these arcs that feel more motivated by like romance or passion or whatever that she seems more so of like care you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So uh, then the Undersiders go and attack the Teeth, uh, accompanied by the Ambassadors. Um, it's a pretty violent fight, but also like really, really mm. entertaining. Um, uh, they chase the Butcher, which is a, a fascinating power uh, set, by the way, um, to Cherish's Beach, where then Butcher is driven to suicide and impales herself on her own sand spear. Yeah. Uh, and Cherish acquires the Butcher's mm -hmm. powers. She is now Butcher. 15. Yes. Very exciting. It took me a second to, like, realize what had happened. At first, I was like, what the fuck? Like, she just does this, and they just stand there? But then I remembered about Cherish, and I got very excited. Um, yes. But it was very violent, this fight. It was, yeah, Extremely. it was just, like, a lot immediately. And it was just, you know, I mean, it's not that, like, the others haven't been. It just, it just seems like this one was so, like, deliberately violent, you know? And it was, like, instigated by... Yeah the undersiders i guess you know yeah i mean they went the on yeah, the aggressive yeah. yeah then again the butcher did say that they were gonna die but that's yeah. that's true yeah but i don't know she kind of um i feel like this is this is like the skitter deciding very much that she's you know she's just gonna go all in you know i mean she like they have the she's had other pointed little moments but i feel like this one especially is very much her deciding that she is going to be aggressive like she you know, everything that she does is going to be, you know, um, this new definition of herself. Yeah. 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 On uh, getting Trish to kill the butcher, um, that's um, a very, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. an idea. I mean, okay, initially I thought it was a very bad idea, but I mean, Cherish is contained for now. That's true. And when you think about it, like, Cherish's power does not, like, synergize with the other powers. Like, it, it kind of, like, overwrites them. Like, she'll kill you at a distance with her emotion mm -hmm. powers, or she'll kill you with... Like, if if you're then close, then she'll kill you with the Butcher powers. Like, it's not... It could it could be worse. I mean, like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. She's kind of, like, in a bad place mentally right now already, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And now she's stuck with, like, all oh, these yeah. other people, all of whom, like, have killed the other yeah. ones... You know, like successive, successfully, yeah. success, su yeah. <clears throat> do you take a How second? You... Successfully, no, like, but like one after the other, sequentially, but like, oh, no, it's sequentially, in succession. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Whatever. Ah, yes. Yeah. You know, so it's like I don't know. I feel like it's that it's that whole thing of like in Stardust. Where it's like all the seven or like six brothers are all dead, but they're following around their last brother and all of them have killed each other, but they're forced to be around each other. You know, they're just like, <laughs> I, well, I, I didn't read that book. So no, it's just <laughs> people who don't want to be together because they murdered each uh, other. You know, yeah. I feel like, oh yeah, they're and all then the, at the yeah, same time, the same she's head, like yeah. surrounded by a city that is full of despair. Yeah. That just, that bodes ill for the future. Yeah. Yes. But also very exciting because she probably will get out. I hope. <laughs> but yeah, it's, I mean, it also raises like, what do you even do with a person yeah. like that, right? Like, I mean, obviously you're supposed to imprison them. That would, I mean, could you send the butcher to the oh, bird cage? Gosh. That's what. Okay, here's here's this. Well, uh, I don't know if I want to. Basically, you you need to put her in like a like a 
like a time lock kind of thing because mm. it, I mean, if you put her in the birdcage, she's just gonna try to kill everyone, and then whoever she kills or whoever kills her becomes the yeah. butcher, and then it's the same thing again. So, oh my god, what if what if they put her in the birdcage and then like it's like dominoes, and then suddenly the the being that emerges from the birdcage is literally everyone in the birdcage all together because they all just killed each other, and it's all contained in one being, and suddenly, oh my god, that's so much, that's so much. That would be a mm-hmm. terrible plan. Yeah, I think I think time lock would probably be the best. Yeah, sounds about right. In that little pocket, you know, that Mirrodin carries around. Um, okay, <laughs> um, so uh, that is uh, that section. Um, so then uh, Taylor goes in and checks mm-hmm. out Rachel's territory, and we see just how much emotional growth uh, Rachel has had. Yes. Oh, Rachel, she just makes me so happy. And this, I mean, like, she she isn't like a main character in this section right Mm -hmm. she's just kind of like in the background and she pops up occasionally and like is contributive and all of this but like she's like really developing you know like in fits and bursts in the background right and we see we kind of walk into the kind of end the culmination of all of that like the emotional and social growth i think um and then like later on with the puppies that she brings for puppy therapy admittedly you know kind of grumpily but um it's still she's still like you know, really come so far, you know? I don't know. It's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And also her loyalty is like super unbreakable, I feel like, you know, now. I mean, before it was like, you know, debatable and all this we're trying to figure out, but she's like very much, she's fully bought in, like not going back, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It it feels like she's growing to the person that she's meant Mm -hmm. to be. She's much more relaxed and, and patient in, in these arcs and onward and it, i think she just feels more secure mm-hmm. um she's confident that she'll be okay even if she messes up some social interactions and she's learning to trust the people around her and that not just yeah, taylor yeah. so <clears throat> yeah this was like a nice moment i think very much so. yeah and this is where we see the sort of little broken family that she's yeah. collecting ah they're funny yes yeah. Um, so, uh, the, the, the final person that Taylor meets is Tattletail mm-hmm. with her, um, room full of, uh, things to know and things to uncover. I need to show you. So do you know that meme with, um, uh, Charlie from it's always sunny in Philadelphia where he's in front of yes. a yes. Uh, board with a bunch of strings mm-hmm. and stuff, mm-hmm. right? That someone made a fan art of, of Tattletail yes. in front of that. It's that really good. Almost exactly what I imagined. Yes. It's no, it yes. is that for sure. Um, but they have this sort of cryptic um, not goodbye um, talking about um, they, they have this you wrote here uh, the means justify the ends kind of friendship assessment. Oh yeah. Well they were talking about um, I don't remember what the exact details of it but they were talking about how like you know they were the means of like becoming friends and all of this and we all you know like they all kind of got together and like it the end bit of it wasn't as like relevant as as I mean, it's very much like the journey sort of thing, but I feel like there was a specific mm-hmm. thing about that. It was like very notable. Oh, because I think that was just how they were ju- they were like defining their relationship, you know? Sure. Because I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> I feel like it was a nice thing. Well, regardless, um, I think it, to me, the scene feels very much like a moment of genuine real yeah. friendship. Yeah. Yeah, I think it does. So, um... Then immediately afterwards, uh, Taylor turns herself into the PRT, mm. and we recall um, Dinah's notes: "Cut ties. I'm sorry." Yeah. Ah, oh, ah, oh, I love it. I mentioned it at the very beginning, but well, I wrote it down, but I forgot t- to talk about it. About like all the pieces in this book, where like there's things that we don't know what is written, you know, or what is said, or that sort of thing. And I absolutely love that. I love the way that that works where it's like we're handed something but we don't know what it is until the end you know and then right here it is you know we we find out what it is the cut ties you know and then like i don't know i just really like the way that that was like yeah that kind of delayed reveal that that was written really well i think yeah Mm -hmm. yeah you also had a little speculation here about telltale's power um because she's like digging around you know like she's making all these notes and all of this you know and i feel like the i mean you said before that like it's like a thing or whatever but um i feel like the headaches are also perhaps you know 
agitating her passenger, you know, because she's digging mm-hmm. around for information on them, you know, and right. I mean, other stuff too, but like specifically, you know, she's seeking that information out. And I mean, maybe they don't, you know, want that. Maybe they don't want it available, that sort of thing. Um, oh, 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 is that why mm-hmm. the Seamer would like redirected that whole, you know, like prayer or whatever, or confessional or what? Amy did, where she like went into the room and was trying to tell dragon things, but then Seamark was like, haha, I'm gonna send that away. Was that oh, was that a thing? Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either, Claire. I want to know. I'm so intrigued by mm-hmm. how the inbringers fit into everything. <sighs> yes. Yes. They are a bit of yeah. a wrinkle. Yeah. Mm. Uh so then we we finish arc uh twenty one with uh an interlude from the yes. number man. Uh yes. Cauldron's accountant slash enforcer mm. prison guard yes. guy uh, so we see a lot about the inner workings of of cauldron cauldron has an end plan um that uh involves the the prt in 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 some ways they have tons and tons and tons of test subjects within um <laughs> you've wrote here within the bounds of all um each each word starting with a capital letter whatever it is they operate in um yes well, I didn't. Uh, I didn't want to keep calling it yeah. like the hallway because I wasn't quite sure, and it seemed to be quite extensive. Ah, yeah. I mean, I think it's just like cauldron's That's base. True. Yeah. Yeah, but there was like, or just, like, or just cauldron like within so cauldron. Many, so many floors, like four plus floors of discontent individuals. Yes. Like that's so much. Yes. Ah. <sighs> yeah. And you wrote here a uh, 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 gray boy oh, question yes. mark. Because I. F- because the encounter yes. with the individual that the numbered man was like, haha, I have all these plans, blah, blah, blah. You can't escape. You will never be able to escape. All of this. But then, mm-hmm. you know, whoever it was, I mean, they had like pieces of themselves like cut out, you know, which seemed like yeah. perhaps that was the, and I feel like there was a phrase, there was like a name, this kid, Grey Boy, but I don't remember where I saw it before, mm-hmm. but I feel like it was within this context. Yeah, no, it comes up a couple places, yeah. Yeah, uh, it it comes up that the two places I know for sure is uh, during Echidna, uh, Eidolon, the anti-Eidolon, I think, reveals that they created Grey yes. Boy and the Siberian. And then additionally, uh, Jack looks at, uh, d- during the the reporter interlude, looks at all of the tubes and, and there's only two that only have one um, place mm-hmm. each. And that's his own tube and Grey Boy's tube. Mm. Yeah, I guess that kind of disproves it, though, right? Because that they, in order to say so, then, you know, Grey Boy must have been out in the world, and this individual hasn't been. So perhaps it's not him. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But whoever it was, very upset. And yes, mm-hmm. I don't know. All of them. There's so many of them that are like, it just, it feels like a mess waiting to happen, even more yes. so than the birdcage. Because yeah. they just, yeah. there's just so much. There's so much that they have. Yeah. Uh, also, the number man was Murder Palace, was Jack Slash in the 80s. Um, and he pulls out his old costume uh, because he's going to be going out yes. in the field. Um, he's going to go under his mm-hmm. old name, Harbinger. Ah, oh, the number man. Or, sorry, I got that wrong. He's He'll still be the number man as a sort of call back to Jack yeah. Slash. But, we yeah, we get his old name, mm-hmm. Harbinger. Yeah. Yes. Also, it's very interesting, you know, with the whole Jack Slash conversation it seems like they have a lot of ties to most of the nine you know like very deep ties mm-hmm. like they they're keeping tabs on like shatterbird and siberian which is actually manton like there's all this stuff you know i don't know mm-hmm. seems very interesting how how close they are with all those people in the past and the present hmm. and they also yes. like seem to have their yes. finger in a lot of pools that are that don't notice the ripples that are happening, you know, mm-hmm. um, which is very intriguing and slightly disconcerting. And I want to know what their whole plan was mm-hmm. with Coil, and I don't know what it is, but it seems <laughs> transferable, which is maybe bad. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, what do you think of um, Number Man's? Uh, he's he's talking to the the mm-hmm. prisoner. The prisoner says that this isn't um, this isn't right. Yeah. Right? This is immoral. And he goes, Ah. <laughs> morals this implication that morals are just another meaningless social construct like money Mm -hmm. that it's just worth nothing well he also i mean i said like he was old myrtle pals right with jack Mm -hmm. flash but then at the same time like morals are 
like they are kind of socially constructed you know i mean like oh yeah we have like agreed upon that these are things are these things are like taboo and these are acceptable and these are unacceptable and these are heinous and you're like all of these things Mm -hmm. and these are like you know we a lot of that is sort of like socially defined you know and and some of it's like oh yeah you know relative in certain you know variations and i feel like there perhaps like there definitely are things that are seemingly universal or like that you know appear across a lot of lines you know but like he he doesn't he has not he like sits above you know with all of his calculations and plans and things and um so i feel like he does he would not he would not deem morals to be something that he would you know have anything to do with you know or like that he would be like oh i'm above that yeah well it's interesting because he's like i mean it hmm Actually, maybe I shouldn't comment on the things because I I don't know how well I can divorce myself from future Uh. knowledge. But, like, even if morals are socially constructed, it doesn't mean that, like, there isn't, you know, some some baser aspects of morality that you could... It it doesn't mean that they're a bad argument. Yeah, yeah. The the fact that it's, like, I think the meaningless bit of his implications, I think that is... Yeah. yeah, His dismissal of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Can't, can't Cauldron just, like, give them all TVs or something? Like, god dang. Like, <laughs> you're just sitting in the cell and yeah, do nothing? No, that's, that's, terrible. that's how you go crazy. Like, ah. yeah. So uh, the next interlude is from uh, Perian, um, her real name, mm-hmm. Saba. She has this almost outsider, but inside uh, the Undersiders, um, as they debate about what to do, uh, about Skitter turning herself in. Um, Rachel is, is ride or die <laughs> loyalty. Uh, she's just, like... She doesn't understand what's going on, basically, but she's like, no matter what, she's yeah, trusting she's Taylor. Yeah, she's like so sure that Taylor has a plan. She's like, yeah. you cannot convince me yeah. otherwise. And that, you know, whatever happens, yeah. we're going to believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Perian is is kind of scared of all her, her teammates and is not super great at the territory ruling. To be fair, she has not had Very a true. lot of time true. to work on that. Um uh, Accord comes in to talk about the the dynamics, uh, and Tattletail is really really pissing him off. And after going through his pers- perspective, we know that he is like every single time she opens her mouth, he's like, yeah. "I'm gonna kill her! Yeah. I'm gonna kill her! I'm gonna kill her!" Well, she's um, just so disruptive. Uh, like that's her thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh. yeah. And she's just like it's so so aggressive. No. It's so much. Um, so th- we we finished with with um, Flechette coming to talk to uh, Perian um, first to talk about romantic things, um, and she's kind of also despondent. She's just trying to figure things out. Mm-hmm. And Flechette basically, um, after we see Perian's background, we know that she's very uh, averse to relationships where she there's a imbalanced power dy- dynamic on her end. Mm-hmm. And so Flechette kind of pledges that she'll be Perian's knight. So uh, that the pirate dynamic will, will um, sway the other direction. And uh, she defects sides uh, when Perian kisses her. Yeah. Ah, these two, they're so funny. <laughs> yeah? I, they just, I don't know. They like, there's there's never like a, I, I don't know. They just, I feel like they're kind of like middle of the road, you know? They're not like, they're not, they're not really like heroes and they're not really, I mean, Perian's not bought, she she has she doesn't seem to have bought into her kind of like her place on the undersiders yet you know like she's still kind of feeling that out yeah. like i feel like they're both kind of sitting in that in between state you know not really attached to anybody except they both keeping they they both keep showing up for each other or really fletch i keep showing up for yeah. Perry, and so i feel like they've kind of like formed this bond but then like not done anything about it for like a while and then also as like a sort of side note like I feel like Fletcher kind of already is her kind of like lieutenant type because like she keeps showing up and like yeah. saving her and yeah I don't know they're both sweet and I don't know they're funny mm-hmm. yeah hey, actually we, we we skipped over the the conversation with um Perian and um Flechette and Miss Militia oh, yeah, yeah, earlier we did. Uh, but that was another flash of mm-hmm. that dynamic where um I, I think Perian pushed back against her like a uh, uh, Flechette like asserting any like sort of oh yeah well because she got all mad uh, about her what she was wearing and like her mm -hmm. her like changing but then i mean she has like a new group of people she's hanging out with you know yeah Yeah. i mean it's more serious than that because it's like you know changing 
yeah. um, focus, I guess. But mm. yeah, I don't know. These two. Yeah. The very intense relationship, very teenager, yeah. very, very young adult, changing life paths, n- not exactly on a whim, but it, uh, changing it on one aspect of their yeah. life that is also not super. Well, I mean, yeah. to be fair, Fletchette did go back home, you know, for a bit and was like, nah, mm-hmm. I'm going to come back. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Then we have Arc 22, mm-hmm. a cell in which... Uh, as you wrote, Skitter takes the advice of a young child and kills Alexandria. Yes. <laughs> Which is really funny <laughs> to me. Uh, so the the PRT uh, put Skitter in a cell, uh, same potentially the same cell that Lung was in before. And um, she kind of takes herself out of herself when they search her. Uh, she showers. It's kind of a humiliating ordeal. Mm-hmm. Uh, or at least it's, they're attempting to make it humiliating. And um, she reflects on how Lung acted in this situation. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting, like, so often, like, whenever she is being subjected to, um, like, psychological type things, I feel like she seeks out either, she, like, she seeks out beings that are not herself, you know? And, like, with with this, where, like, she seeks out her bugs, you know, and she, like, is, you know, trying to figure all of that out, but then at the same time, she's, like, comparing herself too long, you know, like, she's, she's... Mm-hmm. Placing her mind into a space that, you know, is is not her own, I guess. Where, like, with the confrontation yeah. in the school, like, she thinks about Jack Slash and how he would react. And, like, how, you know, like, I, I don't know. She, like, she she draws upon all of these individuals that have, you know, a specific way of acquiring and maintaining, like, authority and dignity and respect and all of this. Um, but it's it's very interesting to me that... Most of the ones that, like, I think almost all of them are are not heroes. Like, these leaders that she's using as yeah. models are not heroes. All of them are villains. Yeah, she could she could maybe take a page from Miss Melish's book, I think. Yeah. Potentially. She's looking for effective yeah, leaders. Yeah, because, like, it's so, it's so fascinating how, like, how immediately she, she decides to think about how they would do it instead of, like, she's kind of, like, written off the heroes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, made me kind of wonder... At the, at the end of this and kind of like in the future, will she be able to divest herself from that habit, you know, of turning to how these individuals would react, you know, in those moments of crisis? Yeah. 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 Um, on a, a different um, path. So I, I really like the this depiction of the casual but brute-ish tactics that the PRT and really all mm-hmm. law enforcement uh, performs. So it really feels from Taylor's perspective that they're like really trying to do it to like get at yeah, her specifically, yeah. right? But I think basically every single thing that she's thinking is just for her is just um, what's the word? Um, Institutional? Procedural? Ooh, that might ooh. be it. I think it might be procedural. Procedural. Yeah. I think it might be procedural. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, these like most of these things are just just procedural. Like they're done as part of putting someone in a cell, you know, strip searching yes. someone uh, the, I mean, they didn't build the cell a hell, uh, when, when she got there, mm. right. It was already made uh, the stuff like the, the light coming on periodically just to, you know, rattle her. That's also yeah. normal. The bed is normal. So like she's being processed by the state, you know, there are like, yeah, there are material things that the state as an institution implements against every individual that it processes, right? Like, in order to grind yeah. the soul of the individual, right? Where it's like, there's these routines that are centered around the body that are very pointedly, you know, meant to take away, you know, autonomy of the self and, like, and like you know, are meant to make it, you know, the expectation of surveillance and, and you know, the lack of privacy and this kind of deliberate dehumanization. I think all those, those are very, like, expected i think from from containment yeah. in a, like a governmental or governmental adjacent you know facility yeah 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 uh so during this whole process she's been listening into the conversations of everyone in the building the whole time uh, really showing how far her listening abilities mm, have, yeah. have come uh so even though uh, Kidwin's uh, laser bug seekers are, are killing her bugs, she's still listening in. Uh, Dino shows up and kind of takes control over her own autonomy and, and mm. knowledge and refuses to let Tag 
uh, pull anything. Um, in fact, gets pissed off and and tells him the chances of him dying horribly, that was which so I think is only twenty two percent or something like that. I know that, it's not very high, which but... is like, um, but it happened. So yeah. that was there was a one in five chance that Taylor would kill him with bugs, and it, it mm. happened. Um, and um, Taylor is both angry about this, but also impressed. Um, and Miss Militia is not really doing that much. Yeah, but I feel like it's because at this point, I mean, she's kind of like stuck, right? Because she doesn't have the full authority. She's kind of, yeah. Miss Militia. Yeah. Like I mean, they like they won't yeah, listen. Yeah. I feel like she knows that they won't listen to what she has to say. Which I mean, mm-hmm. in this moment when I was writing it, I was kind of like harumph. But I feel like it's, <laughs> I feel like it's more so an acknowledgement that she doesn't have the power that she needs in order to like stop what's happening from happening you know right yeah yeah also um the prt is they just they try so hard you know every time she like like all of their leaders keep like getting knocked off and like she keeps breaking in to their headquarters and all of this and i feel like every time they think they've plugged up like all of the leaks in their power over her like they think that they've got mm-hmm. it figured out you know, with like kid wins football thingamajig flying around, you know, killing all of her bugs. But then like she keeps dodging him and I, she, like they just, like she's continually circumventing all of the strategies, you know, um, that they are trying to yeah. implement. Yeah. It, it's, it's funny because it's like, um, I don't know. I, I, I certainly would be upset if any like, r- like criminal that I didn't like was, uh, listening into every single conversation about them and getting kind of a really unfair yeah. advantage. Yeah, sort it's of frustrating thing. if you think about it from the perspective of them. Yeah. Because, like, yeah. they, I, I would be pulling my hair out. Because it's like how... She's, like, mm-hmm. literally the epitome of resistance, you know? Like, mm-hmm. it's... She's she's so hard to contain. She kind of forces transparency, yeah. which is interesting. Wait, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you have yes, a note here about Dinah. bring up Dinah. Um, because she's sort of like another individual, like clock block, clock blocker, I think, um, that kind of has the capacity mm-hmm. to rattle Taylor out of her like methodical rationalizing. You know, we see it at the very beginning, right? But then even again here, like Taylor's immediate re- reaction about hearing about Dinah, both um, in the school and then also especially here, especially when she shows up, is like she's at first very angry, you know, but then like she's able to kind of break herself out of her thinking and evaluate the situation and Dinah's motivations. Um, you know, like mm-hmm. that, like she, she's able to like detrack Taylor's like gut reaction, you know, which is yeah. so interesting that, that she has, I mean, she had power over that before, but she became, she's like, I don't know. She, she, her power as an individual, I think is even more, um, over Taylor than when she was just like this idea that Taylor was fighting for. Yeah, because not only is she the girl that mm. Taylor saved, she's also the precog that, like, you know, knows about the future. And that's, like, th- that sort of utilitarian make the numbers better at for the end of the world is one of Taylor's, like, easy mm. motivations, right? She's she Or she can justify a lot of things with that yeah, in mind, yeah. right? Um, and, like, between the two of those, those kind of combine into a, like, kind of justify anything that Dinah does because both of the personal loyalty and the like logical yeah. loyalty yeah it's yeah. interesting uh, so then um uh kaye uh, her lawyer shows up and um she makes her demands to tag and miss militia um or b- before we move on to the the part about the demands um bef- and before danny gets there uh there's the scene where kaye uh outlines all the charges mm. against her um, and I think it's um, pretty it effective is. in getting us to understand in numbers and terms we're familiar with just how much damage and law breaking she's done. Like she, we start off with the first one, and it's like 37 counts of assault with a parahuman ability. It's like, oh my god, like that's so and much. That's day one. Yeah, I know. And it's just like we go through the entire story and kind of distill it down into this kind of you know very like like uh, you know quantitative account, which I feel like is is very like clear you know it's very sobering yeah it's it, superpowers make you forget very easily that hurting yeah. people is illegal <laughs> uh 
um, because you know anytime she's fighting anyone um you know from uh the thugs on the street to parahumans to law enforcement officers you're just like oh this is just yeah this is just yeah. combat this is how it's supposed to be it's like no this is assault this is assault <laughs> going know, both ways terrible. you know ah yeah it's very interesting yeah. to see it sort of like translated into into material consequences that we can understand yeah mm-hmm. mm. um so uh I want to talk about uh, her demands yes, for yes. a second, right? So what she's asking for is amnesty for the undersiders and protection from future crimes for them. Uh, she wants to, um, she she's okay with serving time in, in a prison, but she wants to be used to hunt the nine or otherwise be employed, you know, mm-hmm. be, be made useful. And um, the, the, the last big one is she wants Ms. Militia in charge of the Brockton Bay PRT, which would make it clear that non humans are no longer in charge. Yeah, which I feel like it's not like a terrible amount of demands, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, placing Miss Militia in power, like, I feel like that at least... That's the biggest one to me. You know, that that at least, like, there's some sort of acknowledgement of change, you know? Like, Mm. that there is, or acknowledgement of the past and, you know, know, kind of reevaluating the PRT and what it means. You know, that I feel like the members who are kind of like, I don't know if I am down with the way that things have been going. I feel like that would be the best, you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it's also like she's making these demands to like the people who don't, who are in power, who don't want to, you know, relinquish their power. Yeah, I don't know. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the same time, you can very much understand the opposite perspective of, uh, I mean, if you're a civilian and you see parahumans start being in charge yeah. of themselves, then it suddenly gets pretty concerning because they are in charge of you yeah, in turn. That's very true. You lose any sort of semblance of power, which it doesn't seem like they had any power at all in the first place. We just like kind of pretended that they did. Yeah. Yeah. And I, like I def- I mean, they, did. they had, they had, a they had, they had like power, a mood power. of power. Pigot did. That's true. Pigot, Pigot was like pretty good, but yeah. But at the same time, Alexandria mm-hmm. was always the chief director. Yeah. I mean, I understand why they don't, like, you know, uh, heed, heed her demands. Um, right. But, I don't know, they don't seem horrifically unreasonable, you know? Yeah. 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 Except, I don't know, but, I mean, she's, that's like asking a lot about the Undersiders, though. I, I really wonder, like, if she had negotiated this from a position of mm-hmm. strength, right? Um I mean, maybe maybe tag makes this less of a good argument. But if she had like gone to them and been like, "Okay, I am currently mm-hmm. free right now, but if you capitulate to these demands, I yeah. will turn myself in." Sort of like a and and you will have me, and I, I swear I won't yeah. break out. I feel like then I, in... I I don't know if she would have gotten all like of them. She... I think tag especially would would really put his foot down and say no. But he also did that here, yeah. so like. I feel like if she approached it in the way that she did when she went to go have a chat with, um, the like when when she allowed herself to be taken hostage in the van, I feel mm-hmm. like if she addressed it like that, or like they met on equal grounds, and then she, I feel like that maybe would have worked for some of it, mm-hmm. but not all of it. Yeah, I don't know. But they, because they all like they all have their own deal that they're doing. You know, like they all have their own plans and and motivations and what they're expecting. You know, right. I feel like her demands really, really didn't fit in with that, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, so then Danny gets mm-hmm. here. Um, they, um, as, as Tag is not really down for anything but blood. Ah, Tag. Um, so he, he shows up and their interactions are like both like friendly and and, and also serious. Um, Tag is, is working outside of these uh, unspoken taboos because he doesn't care mm-hmm. about them um and so su- kind of surprisingly to to our relief danny is pretty much mostly on taylor's side yeah yeah but there's still like this really strange like vein of like cordiality between them because mm-hmm. like i mean he's like yes i mean this was my kid you know but i feel like even in this moment he's still sort of like he has not reconciled the kid that he knows and this person that he is encountering now you know sure yeah i don't know he's still i i feel like this entire time he's just reeling yeah 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 he's been reeling since the mm-hmm. the reveal 
which yeah. was like a week ago. Ah, just a week ago. So, yeah, I think so. I don't, I don't know if that's actually correct, but it was definitely a couple yeah. days ago at least. So then Alexandra shows up and uh, she has this whole routine. She's waiting for Skater to capitulate and she's playing really, really mm-hmm. hardball. Really, really hard yeah. hardball. Uh, she leaves and captures uh, two of the Undersiders one by one on this 10-minute schedule. Uh, Taylor is trying to convey these attacks to Tattletail via bugs and a phone, but she's not hearing the uh, very important responses, capital V, <laughs> capital I, capital R. Um, Alexandria then gives an offer. She's going to free the Undersiders that she just captured and give Skitter uh, a jail mm-hmm. sentence, but that's only the very tiniest fraction of her demands. That's that's like one out yeah, of four. Yeah. So um, refusing is not entirely unreasonable. Um, Alexandria then goes out and brings back a body bag, which could be either be Brian or Rachel. Skitter kills Tag and Alexandria in her yeah. rage. Which is just like, ah, Alexandria, like, what are you doing this whole time? She's just so very intense about it. Huh. But also... This, I think, is another good point um, to note, um, to kind of refer back to that whole conversation she had with Clockblocker about how her after effects are so very often, you know, detrimental or fatal. And and even like harking back to the very beginning with Lung, like she's unknowingly more cruel than like her conscious self, you know? Um, yeah. Which I don't know if this is just like her mind left unchecked and like her bugs left to their you know whatever's but i mean i feel like it's also maybe like her passenger involved left to its own devices i don't know she intentionally didn't um hold back her that's true her bugs. That's she true. had an option to right before she passed out but she, she didn't was just kind of like well and then also Fuck yeah em. i feel like yeah. so often the like mess that gets created with like especially the heroes especially the o- overconfident heroes i feel like it is always, they always underestimate her and like what she can do mm-hmm. and what she will do, you know, like, yeah, huh, I don't know. They sh- it just seems to be, they push her, they push her to the limit that they don't know is there or like, or they, they push yeah. her. No, that's not what I was going to say. The, the limit that they think is there is like so much farther back or like beyond, I guess. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, it's very interesting that her first thought immediately is that she's, like, abandoned, you know? Which I feel like is, like, immediately she's alone, linked to loneliness, you know, all of this. Like, when she's she wakes alone, up, yeah. and there's nobody in the building, you know? And then she doesn't know if whoever it was had died or not, and this, like, I don't know, there's so much isolation that I seems seems like everything's hopeless and all of this, and yeah. 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 And there's, um, there's a phrase that Alexandra used first... And then mm-hmm. she used, which was just in terms of writing, amazing. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. But, yeah, it's really good. Um, I will read it out. Not a promise, yes. not an oath, nor oh, nor a malediction, nor a curse. Inevitable. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought that was really, really interesting. This this sort of, um, I don't remember what the device is, but I love it. You know, it's, it's like the beginning yeah. of The Hobbit, you know, where it's like you describe what it is not. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yes, this was a really yes. good... Oh, this whole arc was just really, really well written. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so Skitter uh, basically makes a daring escape from um, her cell, but not before uh, Defiant and Dragon mm-hmm. arrive. Uh, they capture her. Uh, Defiant yells at her to stop <laughs> trying yeah. things, um, which sticks mm-hmm. in my mind. Before they reveal to her that it was a trick, um, no, none of the Undersiders are dead. Um, it, but Alexandria and Tag both are. So then, um, Defiant, Dragon, Miss Militia, and Skitter, and, uh, with the help of, of, uh, Chevalier later on, they have to make a plan on how they're going to spin this mm-hmm. to the public. How to explain the death of Alexandria without fucking up the PRT even more. Um, and they strike a deal. Uh, you wrote Something is in the oh. Drawer, um, that is the Weaver oh, costume. Oh, oh, if, yes. if you were wondering. Mm-hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. So the Undersiders come in the van to watch Skitter announce herself as Weaver and the as the kind of killer of Alexandria uh, before um, taking off with Defiant and Dragon. Yes. Um, yeah, so she's, she, she picks her name as Weaver. There's a big speech with Chevalier about this is the new mm-hmm. PRT. They're going to be better. Um, yeah. yeah, but it's interesting because she acknowledges that there is that 
requirement of needing to manipulate the situation, you know, and not reveal、yeah. and kind of place it so that people will still be compliant.、Um, which, as much as she like shouts about the PRT and all of this, she like all the politicking that is required, like she does that already on like an individual level, you know,、um, mm-hmm. in terms of all like all the manipulation that she's done. Like I feel in the moments and like I feel like while she protests the kind of large conspiracy type things, I feel like this sort of situation is not uncommon. Yeah, yeah. Untailor. Yeah. Well, what's I just find it so fascinating her her back and forth about、mm-hmm. the PRT because at this point, right after they've、uh, to her killed some of her teammates. She's just raving about the destruction of the purity. Burn it all down. It's all corrupt. Alexandria was a horrible、mm. person. She basically deserved to die, etc., etc., etc. And、uh, not only is most of it, I mean, her arguments aren't you know nonsense, but、um, they're they're clearly coming from an emotional place. But it's a complete complete turnaround from her previous like、mm, speeches,、yeah. right? There was the. The one with Echidna and, and a couple other places where she says we need the PRT because otherwise how we're going to fight against the the Endbringers and here she's like fuck it we don't even need them、yeah. for that、um, so、uh, it's kind of like the first time it actually hurts、mm-hmm. her she switches and says、yeah. burn it down yeah it's very interesting how very specific it is to how it affects her rather than just like it、yeah. I feel like it's the same thing with how she dealt with Coil and Dina where it's like She wasn't thinking about the ramifications and how many people were getting hurt until it was, you know, directly impacting her mentality and her, you know. Well, I guess with that, it was more of like how she felt responsible. But it was there was like one specific thing that, like, you know, kind of switched her.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah.、Um... So, Defiant and Dragon, they appear to have other plans. You know, like this whole time, this whole, this whole. Book. They seem to have other plans, you know, beyond the scope of the PRT, and they're like all, you know, secretly chatting, and it's hilarious every time that they interact. And they're like those two are talking, and she's like, "I can tell that you're like, come on, like you need to speak to me too." Skitter, like she she can recognize when they're having a conversation that's silent. It's so interesting. Um, but、mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's fascinating because both of those two are kind of like the most out of out of everybody in like the. The sort of like heroes, I think, like they're the most kind of walk the line, you know, kind of they are almost vigilantes, you know. Which I feel like, if she is going、yeah. to get stuck with anybody in the like the pre- protectorate, I feel like those two may be the best. Um, so、mm-hmm. her whole plan is maybe going to work out. Also, it's interesting because the instruction that Dinah gave was to cut ties, you know. Um, but she、yeah. did not. She didn't do that. She like very deliberately went around and tied everything up,、mm. so that when <laughs> when she cut them, nothing would fall. You know,、um, mm. yeah. Well, I also wrote that it was kind of like because they're kind of like the strings of like fate, you know, of a Greek god instead of like a mortal,、mm. so they can't actually cut it. You know,、mm. but yeah. So she's like she's sort of、um, followed the instructions of Dino, but then like she did it. You know,、hmm. but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Hard for me to talk about that without、uh, using my knowledge of what happens、ah. directly after. So,、ah. um, but we'll we'll talk about that、I'm、next、so、time、excited. for for sure.、Mm-hmm. So, did you want、yes. to talk about names?、Um, want to talk right. About so, names.、Uh, over the course of these arcs, we see Skitter、um, abandon slash have、um, her identity identity as Taylor、mm-hmm. taken away from her, and then here she chooses a new name, Weaver,、um, and. It's worth noting she hadn't been able to choose either of her names before, right? Her parents、mm-hmm. picked Taylor, and the the heroes、yeah. picked Skitter.、Um, we also have、uh, Yamada's interlude, which talks a lot about names, how the asylum workers shouldn't use the quote unquote code names, how Weld should pick a quote unquote real name. Which、um, parenthetical here,、um, I can see a push against picking a real name because that implies that his current name isn't real, and he's. Always a parahuman. He's never not a parahuman, right? Yeah. Like he does. He doesn't have that secret identity. He, his his job is to be a parahuman, and then when he leaves his job, he's still a parahuman,、mm-hmm. right? So like picking a real name would be kind of pretending that he's something that he's not. So maybe it's like he views as denying a reality. That's the way I view his perspective on names. I don't know. Yeah. Well, because、um, 
The people anyway, who are giving names. him that instruction are sort of like, you must, like, they're, like this, this is something that sits within the kind of like, you know, when you're out and about, when you're off, they, they, they see that divide. They have, they have created a divide that he doesn't have. And I feel like that's, yeah. that's the same thing with all the case 53s where, I mean, it's like the same, like with, um, Gregor, where he was kind of like, this is just where I am in society. You know, like I have, you know, yeah. this, this self that I am now, I have to accept that, you know, I don't have the memory of the past. I have to kind of forge myself into, into something that like doesn't have that anchoring, you know, of like a before. Yeah. Um, yeah. He is, I mean, Gregor is Gregor yeah. the snail. He's, he's got a noble name, mm -hmm. but he's the snail. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too, especially with, oh, that, the whole Yamada, like all of the different individuals who like how Yamada thinks of them in her head and how she refers to them mm -hmm. and how she, like, how they want her to refer to them and like choosing between mm -hmm. their like civilian name and their like parahuman, like cape name and all of this. Yeah. And there, I feel like there's an implication that the civilian name kind of, you know, uh, f creates the conditions for them to be vulnerable in a, like a therapy type setting. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where I feel like, I feel like that's a prescribed thing that, that others have placed upon them, you know? I don't know. It's, a, it's all about like spatial and, and kind of, you know, social positionality, I think, is, is that sort of back and forth between those names. Yeah, well, it's interesting. It's just interesting to see each one picking their identities, and they, they kind of all have different reasons for why they pick one mm -hmm. over another. Uh, Dennis um, slash Clockblocker doesn't really care. It, that's that's how he presents it. Um, uh, Lily slash Flechette is very, very clearly switching between her yeah, two personas. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was um, so interesting to see how immediately mm -hmm. she puts on... Like, she's not even... It's like... Like her body reflects, like her her mentality just like completely changes her physicality when she like answers the phone mm -hmm. as Fletchette, which is so fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, Vista, she wants to be called Vista because that's mm -hmm. the grown up name, basically. She just wants to be called yeah. Missy, right? And Kidwin also just wants to be called Kidwin, but also he doesn't really care about yeah. therapy yeah. at all. So yeah, all of them. But then it's also interesting too when you think about name choosing in terms of taylor because like she's she's thought about this for like a while this concept of choosing mm -hmm. a name you know and and i feel like the act of choosing a name in this particular moment um is a sort of sort of like choosing she's she's like fully embracing herself i feel like because before like mm -hmm. when she kind of jumped into the pair like the the world of parahumans in the cape world or whatever she she was already designated into like a into villain, right? Like right. she did not have like any sort of agency over defining herself um, for like a while. Yeah. Um, because I mean, later on, it's just like it's defined by her actions and her her expectations that Coil is sent to her, where she becomes the warlord. All of this, and then even after she kills, like there hasn't been a moment where she has sat down and and fully chosen what she's going to do and who she's going to be. You know, um, mm -hmm. in in a way that this moment where she chooses to be Weaver um, provides, I think. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I think it does. Yeah. And yeah. What do you think is the significance of this particular name? Hmm. Well, she does a lot of like silk things. You know. Mm -hmm. I mean, because like that whole thing with with the cord, didn't she have like a couple of like beings made out of silk? Oh yeah. Um. Uh, is that what I'm imagining? I feel like I'm. I think the. What was implied was that Parian's, um, like scorpion might have, might have been made out of her silk. I don't know if that's actually oh, true, but yeah, yeah, I yeah. don't know. Hmm. What else? And I suppose she like. I mean, maybe this is too metaphysical or whatever, but it, like where she like kind mm -hmm. of weaves individuals into like a particular thing. You know, like she has she sure. has this whole yeah. like playing field out in her mind, right? She knows the scope of of the or like the landscape. And she kind of, you know, kind of weaves everyone's individually, you know, pieces and powers and, you know, uses into into something that yeah. can work together. I don't know. Yeah. What what I what I find interesting here is right in in arc one, um, and before she she has her own cape name, she talks about 
how it was super, super difficult to、mm-hmm. to pick one. She kind of hated all the ones that she found, and we haven't seen her specifically think of what she wants to call herself.、Yeah. Right? This is a new with the the name Weaver hasn't come up before,、um, and so we don't really know how long she's been thinking、mm-hmm. about this particular name. But she chooses. I mean, she she settles on it fairly、yeah. quickly here, basically. When she needs to become a hero, she picks it. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like I that maybe implies that she has been kind of rolling this around much longer、mm-hmm. than I don't know. There's all these little pieces that she hasn't been, that we haven't seen her thinking to. You know, like she has、yeah. all these things that she's been holding on to, going on in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah.、Uh, another little connection, and this just occurred to me, even though it's it's actually not that deep. It, um, it um, uh, Taylor and Taylor and Weaver. That there's a like a like a tailor is a, like a weaver. Oh yes. The, the, the job <laughs>、yeah, of being a、yeah. tailor, we they weave a little bit. It's true.、Um, I think it's it's a dumb connection, <laughs> but, but it is sort connection of a connection、there. to her real name,、yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how intentional that is, but、yeah. there you go. I don't know. I have thoughts, but I don't know all about them because I sort of think、mm-hmm. I don't know. I sort of think that she had. Well, I guess we would know. We would know enough if she. Had, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well,、uh, that is how we end arc twenty-two.、Uh, then we just have two interludes.、Um, the first one is from Charlotte's pers-、mm-hmm. perspective. She's、uh, caring for these kids,、um, basically wondering what to do in in this aftermath.、Uh, she's pretty loyal to、mm-hmm. Skitter, actually, and、um, we we see.、Uh, Another,、um, we see Stan, the reporter, show up, and basically,、uh, her and、uh, Forrest, another one of、uh, Taylor's employees, and、uh, a lot of the citizens there, basically tell Stan to to fuck yeah, off. Yeah. Um, um, before Danny shows up, and he has to make a decision on how he's going to support or not support Taylor, and so he's kind of here to see what's going on in her territory. And he's still. He seems like in a in a fugue.、Yeah. Basically, he's so just in shock. And he,、um, Charlotte takes her to the base before the underside show up and have a talk about、uh, basically, as as you put it here, property inheritance and the next steps in terms of territory protection. And it's all. I mean, it's pretty. It's a very communal situation. Yeah, well, she's like handing it off to everybody in her territory and all this. And、yeah. I feel like it's a pretty good way that like she's like her little her little territory. I feel like she. She really kind of did well, I think, in her ruling. I mean, some of it's like、yeah. you know, I, th- there's no there's there's no community like a community that comes together once a week to have yeah I know right、barbecue. like it's great so, yeah. yeah this is this is what the anarchist dream is yeah pretty much <sighs> yeah <sighs> but yeah yeah the the it's really interesting too to to see the undersiders from her perspective all the time it's so it's so fascinating to see them from. Kind of the people around them, because、um, we're watching、mm-hmm. them kind of deal with what they're going to have to do, right? And we're having we're we're kind of seeing them kind of find their own footing again,、um, and and she's just kind of in the background, being you know trying to figure out what the next point of all of this is. And I don't know, she's just she's a very like reliable character, I think. Yeah, Charlotte. You know, like、yeah. she's just been there in the territory, taking care of everyone. Like I don't know. Well, she's just. She, I mean, she's gotten like a lot more loyal than I than、mm. I thought she would be. She's so she's kind of confident、yeah. to be here.、Um, we also see Sierra come in,、um, or maybe that was yeah, no, earlier, no. They, well, they at least they bring her in. Sierra is the one that the now owns all of those、mm-hmm. um, businesses that、um, all, all the the property around the portal. She's basically the legal face、yeah. of the Undersiders now. Yeah, yeah.、Ah. So I was actually really surprised reading.、Um, Danny's、mm-hmm. perspective here, because he he he's basically he says that he saw Taylor as、yeah. a as a monster, right?、Uh, which I mean, okay, fair. She did just <laughs> kill two people、true. in front of her. Fair, but but、uh, it really just goes to show just like how just horribly、yeah. apart they are.、Um, and and、um, conversely, it's also very surprising how fiercely Charlotte defends her, right?、Um, yeah, I mean, earlier in the story, she was kind of、mm-hmm. scared of Skitter, right? Yeah, she kind of she really、so. kind of embraced this concept. I think I think too like they they had she was she was worried about like the other shoe dropping sort of thing of like she was waiting for Skitter to、mm-hmm. like not to to sort of stop being so like accommodating or 
she was she was worried that there was you know like i feel like there was a moment when she she was talking to somebody else trying to like make sure that they knew that her you know uh warlord like could you know you know become violent very soon and like they they, they needed to be aware of this mm-hmm. but i feel like i feel like she kind of became sure that this was going to work out i guess i don't know i don't know what the i feel like it was just kind of like a building up sort of thing it wasn't like an immediate mm-hmm. something happened and now i'm loyal you know yeah 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 definitely uh so this interlude finishes with uh charlotte mm-hmm. approaching aiden who has previously drawn some strange yes. strange drawing and he talks about his dream and we kind of get the implication it sounds a lot like a yes. trigger vision hmm Hmm. I don't know the details of it, but I feel like it is significant. And I don't know how. I don't know how it's significant. Because, like, is this did this kid have a trigger event by himself, you know? But then, like, he sort of remembers it, but not really. But then, like, or was he there because he was talking about how Skitter had just arrived, you know? Like, after this, the, the whole day where she, like, after the day that she had spent, you know, being revealed and dealing with everything. After that, you know, she arrives back home and he sees this. So, like, was that her second event? You know, her trigger event? I don't know. But then, I don't know. Like, well, should we have known that she had done that? But then, I mean, there's this whole thing about rising action, so you can't tell everyone about something that has happened. And I don't know. I'm very, mm-hmm. very curious. Excellent I questions to, know. to ask. Yes. Mm-hmm. Hmm. <laughs> uh, so then we have the final interlude of the section. Lung's yes. interlude, a.k.a. Kenta. So he was part of a youthful group of uh, Japanese uh, aspiring Yakuza mm-hmm. members, um, but they, uh, in, in one of their, their first big events that they want to do, um, they basically all die at the hands of Cauldron's yeah. bodyguard. Um, his uh, trigger event occurs when his face is slammed into a bunch of drugs, Um he sees a vision, mm-hmm. um, something about a, a gaseous planet with gaseous yes. inhabitants. Uh, but then we flash forward, and uh, he goes head to head with Leviathan. There's a quote from him uh, where someone asks him, if, "Is are you a villain?" And he says, "I am me." Um, and you uh, wrote here, "Nobody's around to see him be a fucking badass, and he is sad," <laughs> which I <laughs> laughed out loud. Um, but um, so uh, after that uh, amazing climactic fight yeah. of his life he spends some time in isolated spaces routinely asked to join uh, the young bon when he's in the cui um he then escaped to the united states and does this thing with the abb and bakuda but now he's in the birdcage and um a teacher tries to uh get him on mm-hmm. teacher side and uh, he doesn't say yes. no basically and doesn't tell marquis about it either yeah mm. Yes, Lung. I really am so glad that we got this because this was a wonderful interlude, you know? And I think it's really interesting um, because Lung is is such like an inch, like an instrumental piece of like this story, I feel like, and especially Taylor's, like absolutely Taylor's, right? Because it's like that was, he was kind of her first villain, um, you know, her first enemy or whatever. Like, so they began as as enemies right and he's making this list of all these people that he like you know mm-hmm. is ready to take to task or whatever and you know his power makes it seem like he's going to be part like an essential part of the end bit you know where everything like is coming to a head and they're like dealing with whatever threat that is coming you know um and mm-hmm. i feel like he could either be a derailment or like a saving reinforcement sort of thing because he he like has the capacity to fight in bringers right and he yeah. he is power enough, powerful enough to, like, be of help, you know? And he wants to be... He's seeking, like, notoriety. He wants to be known. He wants to, like, be, like, um, acknowledged. He wants to be acknowledged for what he has done, you know? And can do and all of this. Yeah. And um, and while, while right now they are enemies and he kind of, like, hates her guts or whatever, but, like, Taylor's really good mm. at, at picking useful people, you know? And, like... That's true. And, I mean, she's not really, like, super concerned anymore. I mean, maybe she is now, but, like, I feel like the good and bad part is not as important as, like, tactical, you know? you Like, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. uh, usability or whatever. And I feel like if they can get past their kind of, like, you know, if they can get past their past, haha, um, 
<laughs> I feel like they could be a good team, you know? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. It, yeah. It, Lung, Lung is just so <sighs> fun to have in the story, I think. His, yes. his power is just so fun. Um, I mean, this this chapter is just uh, a joy to read, really. Um, Lung's fight against Leviathan, um, I, I would compare that to his mm-hmm. highest high, right? Uh, something that he's always trying to get again. Uh, because you know, I mean, there's a line in there. Is like for a moment he truly was king of the world, right? Echoing the the feeling of yeah. cocaine. But of course, that's not enough. And there's always a feeling that you could go higher. Uh, yeah, which I, I find interesting because it's like an echo of his trigger event. But his like him being slammed into into drugs is not like his like real life trauma. It's not his yeah. emotional trauma, right? Like it wasn't his trigger event wasn't. Um, brought on by a, a life of abusing drugs, yeah. right? And yet his power is kind of an echo yeah, of that too. So, uh, also, Wild Bill literally made a kaiju fight in Japan. I just, I just want to call that out real quick. That's what Leviathan versus Lung is. It's a kaiju fight, which is. I feel like uh, I should know what that is. That's fun. A kaiju is just a giant monster, oh, okay. like Godzilla. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, the, he made giant monsters it was fight cool. in Japan. I, I just liked think it. that's. That's great. Yeah, this whole this whole interlude, I I really liked a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> mm. So, uh, that is all we have for arcs eighteen through twenty two. That's all of the beats. No <sighs> more chapters. So we're done. Uh, we are currently at four hours My and God. thirty minutes. <laughs> so this is a five so hour long. recording. Hopefully, it'll be less for you guys. Um, but okay, let's talk about book four yes. as a whole. Uh, now that now that we've re- recapped it all. Um, I, I really enjoy this. This, uh, Of course, you know, this division is not mm-hmm. perfect, really. It should be, like, um, the Echidna arcs and then the, the other yeah. three. Yeah, there was but, definitely a distinct divide. Um, mm-hmm. But, I, it, yeah, these these sections are really, yeah. really awesome, though. I, I think um, there's we end here on a gigantic paradigm shift, right? Mm-hmm. The huge, some enormous change. Um, I, I really, I don't even know what else to, to compare it to in the story. Maybe Leviathan of just like a sign that this story is not going to be yeah. the same anymore with um, Taylor taking um, the name Weaver and now being a hero. Yeah, she's off to join the other two. But yeah, yeah, it's it's quite a shift. There's very much a distinct like, you know, everything everything at this moment, right, is kind of building towards the like, you know, the end, you know, and I'm, but we're not quite to the point where it's not like the critical bit at the end, you know, like we're still, we're still like, a few steps away from from the end of the rising right. action, you know, um, yeah. which is a great place to be in a story, you know. Ah, so mm-hmm. I think I think it it while while there there are like two different pieces to it. I think it it was a really fun section to read. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's basically as I said at the beginning, most of the dominoes mm-hmm. are placed now, <clears throat> and the first ones are yes. starting to tip over. <clears throat> Which I yeah I, yeah I just really enjoy it and of course those those two confrontations narc twenty narc twenty two are always they're, they're, they mm. they they call to me <clears throat> yeah um okay let's get into Clarence speculations yes. so, um, so I made a list for speculating <laughs> I now? made a very large list yes yes excellent um, that I'm very excited about and I, I well I feel, I feel like I brought a, a few of them up in the middle of it. Yes, but that's all right. We'll, we'll but, recap them yes. anyway. So, the deal with Cauldron, you know, it seems like they're preparing for the flapping beings, you know, um, to come. Like, they know that it's going to happen, but they don't seem to be working with them, you know? Like, they're doing the research, trying to figure mm-hmm. out what's going on, and it seems like they have, and they know something is coming, but I don't know. It it, it feels as if they are trying to subvert the the, you know, kind of naturalized purpose of the passengers. I don't know. Something mm-hmm. about that. Yes. And then Aiden, this young child. I I did a lot of wondering about that. I don't know. I don't know if the kid's going to be important or, you know, maybe Skitter had a second trigger. Um, who knows? Very large question mark there. But I also feel like she will. If this, did, if this was not it, then she probably will. I don't know. It, it seems mm-hmm. to be. But this seems like a good time for it, you know? Enough time for her to kind of sit around and kind of figure it out and then, you know, go into the, Mm -hmm. you know, the final battles and such. Uh, With the nine. Oh my god, I'm so worried about those guys. But also, (laughs) I'm so excited and I hope Cherish escapes. 
Ah, <laughs> yes. Don't you mean Butcher uh, 15? Butcher 15. It's not as exciting as Cherish, you know. Mm. But I'll take it. Yes. Okay. And then the birdcage. I feel like the birdcage, I, no, I don't know if I feel it. I just hope. I just hope that it becomes extremely important. Somehow. <laughs> I don't remember why. I had a theory on it, but I haven't. I didn't write it down, so now I don't remember. But I think also you probably I just, just really, I really like it. I really do, which is terrible because it's like not a great place, but it's just so fascinating, and the people inside are so fascinating. Mm. Yes. Yes. Um. Hmm. Also, Jack Slash and the Number Man. I feel like they're going to have a meetup. You know, something about that catch up. You know, mm -hmm. reminiscing about old times and new times and things that are happening. I don't know. I mean, they're old pals, right? They're old murder mm -hmm. pals from the eighties. Yeah. Um, yes. I'm trying to recall how much was said in that scene. Because um, they, they they killed someone that had power over them. Who? Is basically, that, that's what that scene was. That they killed someone that was previously yes. in charge of them, more or oh, less. Oh, it's very, yeah. very like, Sith-like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. Yes. Hmm. What else? Oh, also, I don't have really a prediction about it, but it's just kind of an idle observation, I suppose, about clock blocker and... Uh, Taylor and Skitter. They just, I really, their banter is so much fun. Like, they're just such fun. I like them. And I don't know, mm -hmm. I, yes. like, I want them to be friends because I like yes. their interactions and I hope there's more of them. And I feel like them, like her yes. as, as like working on the wards, I feel like they, she could either like just have like a nice fun, like bantering all the time or like them two working together is going to be like a mess for like for everybody else, you know? I don't know. Yeah. But that's my opinion. So uh, are those all um, your speculations? Yes. Okay. Let's move on to questions for Clarence. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a couple here. Uh, let's start off with Megafire7, um, who says uh, next week, uh, this week, we'll be, we are touching mm -hmm. on Arc 20, uh, which remains uh, their favorite Arc of Worm. And they think there's a lot in it that, that touches on things that we talked about in last episode. Uh, specifically, um, it brings home the point of Taylor being seen as a more uh, legitimate yes. governing body than the PRT and the heroes. With that in mind, what do we think of the way Taylor chooses to use her reputation and her intimidation to get out of that situation? Hmm. I think I think it's an effective use of her power over the city. Um, but I feel mm -hmm. like it's really only effective because they also had a bone to pick with the PRT. Like, she is, mm -hmm. she does have power, she does have that legitimate governing body. Or she is. She is a legitimate governing body, right? But yeah, basically. I feel like it would not have been as effective if, like, all of them were kind of like, well, we don't have anything. We Like, we're not against the PRT, you know? Yeah. If, yeah, if the PRT had done a better job of fighting off, you know, some of the horrible things that had happened, I think they could have held on to that legitimacy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Megafire also says, uh, also, I love Imp a lot, and the aftermath of that cafeteria scene has some of the civilians make mention of how her brand of justice brought them to the Undersider's side. What do you think about it being specifically her that gets mentioned here? I think there's some, there's a couple teens, like, in the aftermath of that that basically say that Imp um, drove off some, some horrible people or did some oh, terrible things yeah, to them yeah. that had hurt them. I don't know. I think that's, I think it's, we don't, we don't get to see a lot of, like, how she operates, um, but I feel like, I feel like as much as she likes to like be a chaotic force, I feel like she does have like good intentions, you know? And like, she does, mm -hmm. she does yeah. like bring good, you know, impacts, I think, or like change. Um, like when, when it matters, I think she really knows what she's doing, you know? Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, we see her a lot of his like part of the undersiders or like, you know, whenever we're reminded that she's, like, around. But I, I don't know. I feel like she could have her own tale. That, like, I feel like she could be off doing who knows what this whole time, you uh -huh. know? Yeah, yeah. Because she, yeah. 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 Um, grumpy, grumpy Toes, I think yeah. is how you pronounce that, uh, says, I'd be curious to hear a discussion on how Dennis slash Clockblocker is presented as a mm -hmm. foil for Taylor. Very few people, especially heroes, ever shake Taylor's conviction, but he does. His conversation with the Yamada highlights how disillusioned he is, and that's even before the triumvirate re reveal. Yes. I feel like, yeah, well, because he he is sort of what she could have been. Um, 
if she joined the wards, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Because he he, so. he bucks authority in the same way, but he just he comes from a, a different positionality than her. Which I feel like that's why yeah. that's why in the van especially and, and really like um like he can get her to think about things in a way that she would not have. Or like or the way she was choosing not mm-hmm. to examine closely yet is that he kind of mm-hmm. Because to her, I mean, yeah, he's like a ward, but like he he presents it in a way that is reasonable to her, you know, and like thought out mm-hmm. in the way that she perhaps not necessarily not necessarily would think out, but like is logical to her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really want to see them just kind of be friends and, and talk about stuff, but <sighs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I wonder. Yeah, I... but hmm, those two, those two. Yes. You wonder. Hmm. Yes, those two. You sound wistful. No, I just, uh, like, I, I don't want to basically be like, I, I just want to see fanfics of them because I don't want to say that. Oh. Anymore, so. <laughs> but yeah, I do. I, I mean, I want to see fanfics of them just being friends or like Dennis as a as a villain or vice versa. Oh, that versa. would be very interesting. So They have a dynamic where yes. he pushes her in the ways that Brian would not. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That's you know, very they're true. like that's true. bouncier than the other two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they they both kind of they both yeah, affect each yeah. other rather than I mean I, I think Taylor just like refuses to be affected by anyone of the understanders yeah, basically yeah. Um, unless if she's unless if she's choosing to be paying attention but yeah yeah, huh. it, it, yeah. Clockwalker is one of the few that I think made her mm-hmm. doubt um, and um, Grumpy Grumpy Toes also asks um, how we view Tag and the presumed number of people like him in the PRT, someone who says their goal is to uphold the law but will show no regard for it when trying to maintain mm-hmm. their position of power. Yes. There seems to be a lot of those in the PRT, you know, that like... Yeah, they go to, basically. Much, More or less, anyway. They're very much of the mentality, um, the ends justify the means sort of thing, which I feel like is very dangerous mm-hmm. for like a whole crew of people that are ruling, you know, and like deciding the fate of, you know, the law or whatever, which, I don't know, people who, who just kind of think they are yeah. above it, I think are, or beyond it or whatever. Uh, well, it's interesting because a lot of it's like, if you are in the position of power, you kind of get to decide what is the law, yeah. right? When uh, when the state kills someone, it's not murder mm-hmm. usually, right? Yeah, uh, because it's state distinction. Uh, present circumstances. Yeah, present circumstances. <laughs> present world circumstances Ex- is a yeah. good example uh, of that. Uh, yeah, all the definition. Whenever um, it's like the the pos- the individual in the position of power, all all the definitions um, that apply to uh, you know the public or the totality of people get real uh, jelloey. You know. Yeah, that's an interesting term. Yeah. Mm. Uh, the the last question we have here is again from Megafire Seven, uh, talking about Brian. After seeing his second trigger event, his interlude, and his response to the twisted trigger visions inside Echidna, I'm wondering what your perspective on his telling of his first trigger event in Arc Four. I went is. back and read it, um, mm-hmm. and. The way that he described the situation is that he did not feel anything. He was like, oh, yeah, you know how, like, there's, like, this commonality of feeling these things, and I just didn't feel anything at all. Um, I don't know if I believe that. Um, but also, mm-hmm. at the same time, I don't know if he would be able to recognize it. You know what I mean? Well, like, mm-hmm. in the moment, for him, like, to him, perhaps it seems like that cold and calculated, you know, sort of... I'm going to, you know, beat the shit of my mom's boyfriend who's like, you know, doing all this shit, right? But then um, perhaps he he just isn't, he doesn't process, you know, the intensity of, of what he's feeling, you know? Cause, because later, like with mm-hmm. the second trigger event and with, with his kind of, you know, his PTSD in, in the aftermath, um, he doesn't, he doesn't hold the, like, like the equipment, I guess you could say, or like the, the, like the foundation to to you know process how like the intensity of his emotional distress in that moment you know Mm -hmm. so i feel like his coping mechanism before was just to kind of was what taylor does where she just kind of tucks it away and doesn't examine it Mm -hmm. i i i do Mm want to suggest that um do want to suggest that it could be that that brian is especially during that that first time not saying the full truth or maybe saying a different version of events huh. than what really happened huh interesting 
No, that's actually that's very true. That that's and so creepy. if you think about that, then what would your speculation be? And you could take a second to to think about it. That he murdered him. That he actually murdered him. I feel like he could actually murder him. But I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Hold on. Let me contemplate. And and again, also thinking about how, like, what was his second trigger event and how that worked and like what sort of. I think there's uh, there's a place somewhere mm. about how second trigger events usually are like somewhat similar to the first one, but like worse. Oh, interesting. Hmm. I don't know. Then perhaps he like he was there before, or like that he witnessed, because like his second trigger event, right? Is is I mean it's his like veins and all that you know everywhere, but then also mm-hmm. it's witnessing his friends being like cut open and dug around it. Yeah. So perhaps. Perhaps it was something that was like that where it wasn't it wasn't quite as calculated, but maybe it was like he he walked into the situation instead of seeing the aftermath of it and kind of making assumptions. He actually watched walked into the situation and saw what was going on. Hmm. I don't know. I'll let the the the, the end of the, mm. the the speculations there. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, that is all we have for y'all <laughs> this week. It's only four hours of content. Four hours. Well, we're at four hours oh and fifty fucking minutes. We're gonna finish at at five hours. Oh my god! Um, not that it's that unusual for us, right? The what was it the last time? It was like six hours I feel at like least. It was a while. Right? I mean, well, we took yeah, like a big true. break, but in we it, did. But it was a while. Something like that. Yeah. We're we're a mess. Uh, but so uh, stick around through our through our outro. Thank you very much. Um, what is happening in Doof Media? That's a great question. <laughs> oh, for us. Thank you for you're asking. You're welcome. Uh, so the, the the two things I want to to the plug is um, Kingslingers is, is still going strong. So if you're a Stephen King fan, go check out that podcast. It's fantastic. I have not listened to it because I've never read a Stephen King book. Uh, but they're they're going through the Dark Tower series. I think mm. there are multiple books in, and um, yeah, it's it's absolutely brilliant. Um, I also want to plug uh, MediaMD, who uh, this week um, are doing Battlestar, Battlestar Galactica, um, and in one fortnight is their four-year annual checkup, where they look back on all the stuff they covered throughout the year. So MediaMD, um, each week, uh, Elliot and, and Ruben, uh, e- e- every two weeks, uh, recommend mm. to each other a piece of media, and then they uh, talk about it as well. And um, yeah, so this is going to be their their four-year anniversary wow. in two, two weeks, which I think is really, really cool. And I think if you haven't checked it out, uh, maybe consider doing it now. Dang. Mm-hmm. Man. Is Fortnite two weeks? Uh, yes. Man. Yes. Uh, if you like what we do here at Doof Media, consider donating a single dollar per month or whatever else you can afford. It's it's due to the generosity of our patrons that we're able to create shows like this. You know, um, the patron dollars are, are what pays like hosting fees and how we're to like, we're able to get like, you know, equipment and all of this and and it also like facilitates some things like the fan art contests and and you know kind of gives us the ability to provide content for the community that um you can enjoy mm-hmm. uh to do that you can go to patreon.com slash doof media and see all the great patron rewards we have uh what do i want to plug this week I always i always forget <laughs> to actually plan this out um uh, one that doesn't get recommended very often at the 45 dollar huh? level the, the, basically the highest one, I believe. I think there might be one more above that. You can make the Doofcast watch a show, watch a whole season of a show, a ton of content that way, or maybe a book that might also be an option. I don't remember. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but if you want to do that, you can recommend, uh, recommend uh, a series of anime or whatever and uh, say that you want me on there, and then I'll be on there, and I can talk about an anime that you like. That's just a suggestion that you can do. Wow, um, such power. But for for every single recommendation, um, you can also just uh, recommend um, ask whoever you want to be on on there to be on there. So uh, if it's anime, maybe don't recommend Scott or Matt or really most of the Doof cast oh, so sad. in general. But you can recommend me and Jarvis for sure and Michael. I think uh, yes uh, or anything else. Man. Um, mm. Yes. Also, also. Um... Consider donating to Wildbo's Patreon as well, um, because you know, I mean, Wildbo has created this world that we all get to like, you know, live and experience. I mean, we're not living within it, but like, you know, you know, we get to we get to read through it and and you know, experience this over and over, right? And yeah, and yeah, a like this episode on it. He's like he's like the beginning of this watershed moment of like this you know community, and I think 
you know, he relies on this, you know, to this income to make a living and, you know, all of this, and he's still writing and all of this, you know, it's, I don't know. It's really cool. And we should support him. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you do not have money for Patreon, we completely understand, but there are plenty of other ways to help us out. You can go tell someone about Worm um, or mm -hmm. tell them about this podcast. And that helps us all immediate, um, immensely. Uh, you can leave us a rating or re review on iTunes or whatever your podcasting app is. Um, those are really, really great ways to help us, and we really, really do appreciate it. I should check the iTunes reviews. If there have been iTunes reviews and I haven't read you, I will read you next week, I promise. Uh, and I will emphasize yes. how awesome you are. Uh, to reach us, um, you can send us an email at uh, decomposingpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can send us a question. You can send us a comment. You can send us whatever you want. You can send us fan art of me and Clarence as well. Also, Clarence, we got to get a picture oh, of yeah, you on the Duke Media website. We haven't done that. I apologize. Also, my, my picture is from my freshman year, and I've tried to change it, and it just oh, refused to you. let me change the picture. Yeah, it really is. Um, <laughs> uh, or um, another way to reach us is to follow us on, on Twitter, uh, that, at DecomposingPod. De decomposing uh, that's where you can get the first um, moment uh, to, of, of announcements and things like that. That's where you would have found out uh, mm. of us missing last week. Um, which uh, we apologize. I went out of town, um, and uh, which was not really my choice. How it goes? What happens? So, um, but but uh, I'm 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 glad to be back and able to record. But um, yeah. So anytime something else happens, also like this episode mm -hmm. was also delayed a day in, in addition because of other reasons. So it's a good place to follow and check uh, any any time you want to find out about what's going yeah. on. Um, do yes, you want yeah, to read yes, that section? Because yeah. I talked so much already. All right. So next week is our perspectives episode um, for this for this uh, book four. And so by the time this episode comes out, it will already have been recorded uh, because we can't read book five until we you know record this and and we want to give ourselves ourselves extra time to do that. Um, so we won't be able to take audience questions until the next overview episode. Um, however, we'd love to hear about what you guys thought of this episode. So you can do that at the Reddit thread linked in the description. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all we have for all this week. Uh, for those reading along with us, the next section is arcs 23 to, through 26. Um, but next week will be our mm -hmm. perspectives episode. Yes. Yeah, we'll be doing all of our literary theory digging. And I have many plans. I'm very excited. I have many plans for all of these unexplored themes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to read out? Oh, you wrote did. some stuff here, and I, I would love to have you read them out. I did exclamation read, points uh, included, okay. please. Here, here are my thoughts moving forward. This is my like. After I finished the whole script, I sat down and like wrote these out. So I still want to read. You know, mm -hmm. I still want to read Taylor and like all of her friendships from like a second or third wave feminist lens. You know, and then I'm very excited about clothes, especially. You know, like I feel like this is a great time to like have a chat about clothes and costumes, and like her school getup that whole day where she's walking around with those like like she's wearing like fucking cargo pants and like a topless or like a not <laughs> a shit like a, a st strapless top. Strapless and, top. Yeah. Yes, materiality. You know, like as this reflection of like greater changes and alliances, all of this, I'm very excited about it. And, oh my god, ah, I forgot, Accords, Accords, Lackeys, and all of their funny little like gala wear in the middle of like the fucking battle and they're sitting on the dogs and it's just, <laughs> it's great. I want to talk about all of it. Okay, that's our episode. Excellent. Wow, we're only two minutes from five fucking hours. <laughs>